Big Sills! Yeah, good afternoon, all. And buckle up. You see, this is your resident Philly slash, well, anything show. Because you know what here? This is the Supreme Court of Sports. We make judgment. We have profound answers to problems that you may have with your respected sports teams without having the hyperbole of waving the banners and the pom-poms that many of you have. Hey, by the way, don't forget March 23rd. Big Bill and all the rest of them guys better get their audition tapes in because that's the last day you can get your audition tapes in for being the ultimate Eagle cheerleader. It's right there on the website. Right there on the website. Holy cow. That's right, Fiction. Let's get it. I like that on a t-shirt. Let's get it. LFG, baby. LFG. LFG. Oh, hey. I need your help. And we are doing something very special with our advertiser. Um, and we are making this happen here, folks. And we would like you to be part of a great partnership here at Jacob with Underdog Fantasy. March Madness is here. Folks, this is absolutely dope. Tons of people already signed up yesterday. Jacob Sports is looking for a select 500 people to sign up with our great partner, as I said, Underdog Fantasy. Now, look, here's the deal here. The minimum is 10 bucks. You can go as high as 100 bucks, and Underdog Fantasy will match it. You hear me? They'll match it. So you put 10 bucks in, you got 20 bucks. You put 100 bucks in, you got 200 bucks, and you can bet throughout the tournament. And I'll be involved in this thing here for the March Madness tourney. Now, remember something here. The code word is WIN. W-I-N. They made it simple for me, so I didn't have to go on a diatribe. A spelling here. W-I-N. With our great friends at Underdog Fantasy. Minimum is 10 bucks. Easy to sign up. And we hope you join us. And already, people are already doing this. And we so appreciate it. Thank you guys so much. We'll hit on this a little bit more. We'll expand on it a little bit more as we get into the tournament. We so thank you. All right. Now, it does look like there is a small market starting to develop for Hassan Reddick. Okay? It does look like that. By the way, 304 reminds me of another promise that we have to keep. All Super Chats, no matter what I'm doing, there's a pause. I've missed some of them. Xander's like, Sells, come on now. All right? Why do the Eagles fan talk bad about Allen when Hurts is 0-3 in the playoffs when his defense gives up more than seven points? Because for whatever fantasy, 304, they think that Jalen Hurts is a better quarterback than Josh Allen, and he's not. He's not skilled more, and he's not a better quarterback. How can a guy lead the NFL in turnovers and still win the AFC East four years in a row, finish second in the MVP voting? How's that possible? You know why? Because he carries a football team on his back. Most of the time, Jalen Hurts is the caboose. He's not the engine on the team. The engine is A.J. Owens. Oh, by the way, we got another guy who's a little sensitive. We're going to get to that here in a minute. Okay, nobody on nobody outside of Philly. Nobody outside of Philly believes that Jalen Hurts is a better talent than Josh. Nobody. Nobody believes that. Except the people in Philly. So you can sit in your own lie and in your own mud puddle and think it. I'm not going to debate that any longer. I'm, I'm not going to debate that. You, you can sit here. What does he want? Hey, what does Hurts want? Dick. Nothing. A consolation prize. 
Hell, if I get beat in the playoffs, I'd rather get beat by um, Patrick Mahomes or Lamar Jackson and not Baker Mayfield. <laughs> okay? So, 304, we answered it to you. And you see people going, not Josh Allen again. Someone brought it up. They put a super chat. Thank you very much for doing that, 304. Don't listen to some of these ass bags. Whatever you want, when you do that, we respond to it. How you doing? Okay. Does look like Reddick does have, okay, a market. Atlanta looks like they're in the mix, and so is Baltimore in the mix. So it's starting to pick up for Reddick. When Hertz is on, he's electric, but Allen is the better quarterback, hands down. Correct. That guess. Jalen is a re- hey, watch this, man. Joe Burrow's a great quarterback. Is he better than Mahomes? No. Okay, what's you know what I mean? <laughs> you can you can win a Super Bowl with Joe Burrow. But Mahomes is the better quarterback. No, we have the best. No, you don't. He's top 15 best. Can you imagine if Josh Allen played in the NFC? Josh Allen would have won the last three NFC championships easily with the competition in the NFC. That's not a debate either. Okay? Brock Purdy, Josh Allen. (laughs) Brock Purdy um, versus Josh Allen. That's funny. Okay, you imagine Josh Allen on that Eagle team? Good night. Now, hey, it's not going to be, you're not getting a first or second rounder for Hassan Reddick. You are not. And by the way, why is it so difficult for Eagle fans to understand what I said yesterday about them pushing him out? I have actual people on my Twitter page at Dan Cilio show, telling me, no, they're not. When every move that they've made so far is indicative of somebody being pushed out. They drafted a guy in your position. They hired a guy at your position. They told you to go look for another team. They moved a bonus. What else do you need? What else do you have to be told that you're not wanted back in Philly? What else? You're not getting a first rounder. Reddick is not signing these deals. You know why? Because they're not offering him 25 million. I'd be shocked if they're offering him north of 20. There's not a team right now that's offered him more than 20 or he would have took it. You know he would have took it. And they signed a guy and gave him more money than Reddick and what he's making now. How can that not be an insult? Let's just take it for that. So you sign a guy who's had one year versus a guy who's put four years back to back and you paid him more than the guy you have on your team. I don't know. When are you Eagle fans going to get it? Here, I'm going to help you out. Do we need to, like, put some sort of, like, like a juju spell off you or something? Why are you guys under this spell that the Eagles want him back? Brian goes, Reddick comes back here for the same money. Yeah, for the same money? Yeah. Yeah, for the same money. Okay, for the same money. You are not listening to what the team is doing. You would rather hear cheerleaders on WIP or cheerleaders on this network telling you lies. They don't want the player back. Their actions are telling you this. You guys had such a problem with that yesterday. Okay? You had such a problem with that. And now there's some teams out there that are showing some interest. Hassan Reddick will get a three and a six. 
That's it. A three and a six. Brian Burns got a two and a five. That guy's half the player Brian Burns is. Okay? Half. I wouldn't doubt if Washington stepped up. They got the money to pay the guy. They got the money. Make Reddick finish his contract. They don't want him here. Hey, I'm with you, John, not giving him more than 19. I agree. I think that's exactly right. I think it's like 18-5. Rock steady. Thank you so much. Those are kind compliments. Thank you. When you have other opportunities and you have other options, we appreciate you saying that. Imagine being so stupid you think the Eagles signing an all-pro back with Hurts under center and top five line is a mistake. How this man has a following is beyond me. It's because of your idiotic ways that people come here because they know you're the dummy. You sign a luxury position when your defense has not been upgraded to this day. And you think signing a running back to your backfield was the number one priority on your team. What a dummy. You can't be any dumber, dude. A bag of nails is smarter than you. You think Saquon Barkley makes Hurts better? Really? You had two Pro Bowl players the last two years. Barkley's done shit the last four years. In New York, coming off the knee injury. He's averaged 700 yards a year. And this guy thinks this guy is still first-year Barkley. Okay, let's see it. I'll tell you what, he and Barkley can't wait for it. I haven't... That guy has not lived up to the second draft pick in the draft. He was a New York failure. Did New York fail him? Yep. Yep. No question doesn't help Jalen. That's right. Jalen, Jalen's problems are not running. We're going to get to that here in a minute. Jalen's problems are he can't read a defense. He's not a great pocket passer, and he struggles with the blitz. Boom. Boom. Sills, when there's no market and player is forced to take less where they are, will they give a half-hearted effort the following year? Sam, I think that's exactly what Barkley did in New York this past year. Getting that one-year bullshit deal. I even said it. Why would I play and go out and break my back for the Giants when the Giants don't want him here? The Giants didn't want him there. Why in the world would he play hard in New York when New York didn't want him? How will Barkley improve the team? By taking catches away from Devontae and, and, and AJ? So you're going back to being a running team. I'm confused. Which is it? Oh, I forgot. Because Jalen spreads the ball around so well, which is a complete lie. He doesn't. He throws the two dudes, and that's it. He's the most predictable quarterback in the NFL, and everyone knows it. Barkley going to ball. Great signing. Okay. I'll take Derrick Henry any day. He's the better player. The guy in Green Bay is better. The guy in Green Bay. How you doing? By the way, I thought that this was dope. Hey, Sills, you're the best. I've seen, <laughs> you're the best I've seen. Don't let up. That's a compliment, man. You guys are really awesome. Thank you so much. One read hurts. <laughs> That's his new name. Actually, I'm going to start calling him Jalen Calarulo. That's Bill's boy. The boy wonder. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Jalen Calarulo, hold on here, man. I love this clip here by her by Prescott. Unfortunately, it was Tad Prescott's top 10 current NFL quarterbacks. Patrick Mahomes one, Dak Prescott two, Lamar Jackson three, Josh Allen four, Aaron Rodgers five, Joe Burrow six, Tug of Viola seven, Golf eight. 
Matthew Stafford, nine, and Joe Flacco, 10. Okay. Uh, maybe that kind of ruins the, the bit here a bit. No Jalen Hurts. You said quarterbacks, not running backs. Bang! Holy shit. <laughs> yeah, Jalen's the best passing running back in the league. There's no question. Never seen anything like it. Dude, he put Joe Flacco at 10. Okay, I'm not sure that list is validated. And I think he kind of hurt the whole deal there. Seals better pray the Eagles don't get back on track next year. Why would I wish that? So that I could sit here and cover a dog shit team? Who wants to do that? You missed the point again, Doug. Still smoking that fish scale. Yeah, okay, because your boy two years ago was really good. Yeah, I know. Hey, man, two years ago. Hey, three years ago, man, I could chase my old lady around a lot better. But, you know, as I've gotten older, knees are going, back's not what it was. Got to mark things down on the calendar. How you doing? You know, I mean, I don't know, man. Huh. Sills knows Burt Bell is legit. I know Carson Wentz won one. Thanks, Arthur. Carson Wentz won the Burt Bell Award. <laughs> hey, my uncle won it. Fans should be thankful for Sills putting pressure on the front office to improve the team. And you know how you know that's working? They call my bosses because they watch the show. How you doing? The Eagles and folks call my bosses. That's not a lie. That's not a lie. I'm the only show in Philly that bosses have a backbone to fight back. He's got a right to say what he wants, dude. He's, I mean... My bosses say this, this is America. He's got a right to say what he wants. As long as it's not over the line, we don't have a problem with it. <laughs> don't ever say that to me. You give me carte blanche to do that? Good night. <laughs> How you doing? You're not going to get it kindly. It's going to be a rough one. This going to be a rough one and an honest one. Bill's, Sills basically saying the Eagles are going 0-17, see? Look how Eagle fans get so sensitive. You're like Barkley now, responding on Twitter to Giant fans because his daughter said something about, now we're going to win, Dad? And then Giant fans are now all over Saquon. Hey, Saquon, fuck them. Who gives a shit about the Giants? They care more about you signing with the Eagles because that's the only thing they can root for now because their team stinks. So what? What, am, what? what do Xander and Big Joe tell me? Hey, try punching up. That's old news, dude. Don't be like A.J. Owens. Don't be A.J. Owens. And start moaning and crying on social media. Well, you guys, he, he also screamed at Giant fans. He had a terrible relationship with Giant fans. Screaming at fans. Dude, don't be so sensitive. Relax. You make $13 million. You're Saquon Barkley. Act like it. Okay? Franco's fake news. There's an all... Actually, Frank, there's a fucking video of it. Yeah, try that one. The guy watches CNN, you could tell, because you could report anything without facts. See, I'm commenting on something that was posted. How you doing? How you doing? <laughs> okay. Best thing for Jalen is to trade AJ. Sales them WIP guys wearing them Howie knee pads. Don't you get... So Dude, honest to God, Mitchell. It's got to be tasking getting up and down every day off your knees. Okay, honest to God. And just bowing to the Eagles every day. No wonder Angelo comes on here all the time. It's just got to be exhausting. Up and down, up and down, up and down. 
holy cow, it's like being at a brothel. Up. <laughs> holy cow. Hey, it's like being at a brothel over there. Don't oh, got these guys. Unbelievable. The greatest on the no, 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 no. I'm awake. Are you? You're missing it. WIP is king because of people like you. It doesn't matter who the hosts are. It's the Eagle fans that I tell you that I love the most. It's not the team. It's you. You are the passion of the Eagles. The Bills fans, Bills Mafia, the Bucks. Oh, by the way, we got a packed show today. Ian Beckles will join us. Former Buccaneer uh, will join us. And of the Ian Beckles show, he and I worked at WDAE together. Hassan Reddick is a weapon. Big Sills has final say on the Dan Cilio show. Kudos. I like that. Content-wise, yeah. I do. Inside the Krause's guardrails, yeah, I do. Krause's have guardrails, and I put my stuff inside there, and we're all good. Yeah. Okay, so Ian Beckles will join us. At 3.30, Herm Edwards, ESPN analyst, former Philadelphia Eagle, will talk some pro ball with us at 4.30. Randy Cross from CBS Sports, owner of three Super Bowl rings, talks college sports as well, will join us at 5.30. So, 3.30, former Buck and... Host of the Ian Beckle Show on WDAE in Tampa. We'll talk to him about Devin White. That's where we're going with this. Herm Edwards, ESPN, will join us at 4.30. 5.30, we will have Randy Cross, the owner of three Super Bowl rings. Let's move on to the topics. Hey, man, wh- by the way, where was Hurts in that Prescott top 10 quarterbacks? He said, wait. I say quarterbacks, not running backs. Okay? All good. (laughs) Okay? Facts get the final, whatever that means, done. Sills, how he looks at the roster like it's fantasy football. Saquon, 15 million when you could have spent 20 million on Christian Wilkes. Um, I would have... I would have went for Xavier McKinney instead of spending that money on on Barkley. Absolutely. I would have spent that there. All right, let's move on here. So, let me go here. Where to begin? Do I take my shots at Hurts here? Or do I do it at Bryce Huff? Or do I look at the Eagle defense, which I couldn't believe somebody gave me a depth chart over there? I can't tell you who gave me the depth chart, but someone gave me a depth chart from the Philadelphia Eagles last night. Which do you want? Hurts, the Eagle depth chart for defense, or my Bryce Hoff take? Where do you want to go? Marcus goes, you're always taking shots. The Eagles are easy to take shots at. They do stupid shit. Okay? They do stupid shit. It's not it's not that it's not that hard. Leave my QB alone. <laughs> no, no. Okay. Big Ben goes like this. Prove what? Prove what, Big Ben? You mean your defensive line coach who asked me and called me when he was at Miami and I helped recruit? If he could wear my number 93, who I've known his entire life professionally, you mean him? He's just one person in there. You know, Jeff Stoughton was a Miami Hurricane, too. Just curious. Okay? (laughs) You don't know Clint Hurt. Really? There's very few Hurricanes I don't know. Okay? Here we go.
This, my friends, is top secret. It is top secret. And it will be divulged here for the very first time publicly. The depth chart as it sits. Now, for the Philadelphia Eagles. By the way, I have to apologize to somebody in here, and I'm going to explain here in a second, because you were right. They did do this. I didn't think they were going to. But they did do this. And I am pretty shocked that it's come down to this. Okay? Here are your Eagles so far right now, today, on March 20th. Here's your depth chart for your defense. And I'm going to start from the back end and go to the front seven. Okay? Darius Slay is your safety. Reed Blankenship is your free safety. Gardner Johnson is your strong safety. James Bradbury is your left cornerback. Now, this one gets interesting. Strong side LB. Hassan Reddick slash Nolan Smith. <laughs> okay. Why would you have two guys listed on the first team? Huh. Interesting. How you doing already? Before I continue, what do you notice already about the defense? Okay. What do you notice already about the defense that I've named just four players, really five players? Okay. What, what do you notice? Very good, John. Very good. Very good, John. Bingo. They are moving to a 34. Okay? Right inside linebacker. Was I right about Milton Williams? Marshall? Shut up. <laughs> okay? Devin Betty White is your right inside linebacker. Left inside linebacker. All Southeastern Conference. Buckus Award winner. Unbelievable brain and could work at NASA and the engineering department. Nakobe, I don't know if I could ever play. Jimmy Dean. How you doing? Kobe Dean is a starting linebacker on your football team. He couldn't make a Canadian football league team. Holy shit. Your will linebacker is the greatness of Bryce Huff. And your three down lineman, Jalen Carter's your right defensive end. Jordan Davis is your nose tackle. And your left end is Milton Williams. And they got Jalen Carter and Josh Sweat split in time. Was I right about Milton Williams? Yes. They got Milton Williams as the left defensive end. And get this, they really, somebody added in because I didn't see it on the depth chart that initially gave me Josh Sweat's name. They still could be moving this dude. They still could be moving him. 
When I first got the first depth chart, I said, so you guys are going to a 34? Here are your four linebackers. Not one of them can tackle. Or all of these guys will be the worst rated linebacking core against the pass in the National Football League. Reddick can't cover. White can't cover. Dean can't cover. And Huff can't cover. Congratulations. You downgraded. Okay? You've downgraded your linebacker position. And you've gone to a 34. Why would you take Sweat off the field? When Sweat is better than Bryce Huff. Holy shit. You're going to a 34 because Fangio runs the 34. This is why Reddick's out. Sills, the boiler room awaits Howie if the season tanks. Holy cow, man. Good grief. This defense sucks. Here's the people. Watch this. And Brandon Graham's the backup for Milton Williams. Old man Graham. Milton Williams playing a position he doesn't play. I think he could play it, though. I like him. Jordan Davis. I guess he's a nose tackle. That fits his position. Hey, that fits the position. Okay. Oh, I forgot about Orenthal Burks. <laughs> Jalen Carter's going to play end and set the edge. Okay. I followed him in college sales where he was a primary defensive end. He learned to play DT. How you doing? Uh, dude, that's where they got him listed as left defensive end. They got him replacing uh, Brandon Graham, and they don't have Josh Sweat starting. Sills, the boiler room awaits Howie if the season sucks or tanks. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, he said old man Graham. He is old man Graham. what I miss? Did he get the fountain of middle age? He said, he said old man Graham. He is old man Graham. You see, you don't like the way I talk to you. I get it. You're used to people bullshitting you. Okay? That's why some people don't like certain people in the world today. Because they don't like the way they talk to you. I can't help that. That's a you thing. Think you missed Isaiah Rogers. They don't have him here starting yet. I think he's still, if I'm not mistaken, Nick, um, has he been reinstated by the commissioner yet? Has he been reinstated? Okay, I, I don't know that yet. Has he been reinstated by the commissioner's office? So if he hasn't been if he hasn't been reinstated by the commissioner's office, he's not going to be on a depth chart in an, uh, like in a locker room depth chart until he gets his clearance from the front from the NFL's um, commissioner's office. Now, until that happens, he's not going to be on this. So I'm assuming that they'll change that up once he becomes eligible. Okay. Good question. Not sure, but he, once he does, he's definitely starting a long slay. Sills is funny as hell. Entertaining. Sinbad. Um, thank you. Thank you? Yeah, I'm the same way. I have no time for fake people. Waste of time. Not my cup of tea. Yeah, they like people. See, most people like to hear bullshit. They don't like to hear the truth. They want to hear lies. They're comfortable. You see, co lies are comfortable. That's why people tell them. Okay? Lies are what people want to hear. Because it makes you comfortable. I'm the other way. I like to make you uncomfortable a little. That's what truth does. Okay? That's what truth does. Makes you uncomfortable. No way. I can't do that. <laughs> I know, kid. It's all right. Big Seals is there to help you out. I'm a, hey, you know what I am? I'm like a sports talk host, Edema. 
That's what we are here. <laughs> okay? We're the thing you don't want to have to take, but you know you need it. <laughs> We're the sports host enema. Hey, Don. <laughs> oh, man. Dude, I can't believe they got Josh Sweat not in the starting lineup. I, I mean, you, you, you think you have line. But they are forcing the Kobe Dean into the starting starting role on the Eagles again. Howie doesn't know when he, hey, this in, Howie. Now, some of you guys, I got to tell you, some of you guys, this is not for you, this because this is for the people at the Novacare Center. Howie. This is a PSA, okay, for you. And this is a public plea, basically. Let it go. Let it go on Dean. Let it go. He's not good. He can't stay healthy. It's a failure pick again. Like all your linebacker picks have been. He's a failure. Failure. It's three years. If it was a woman, you'd have left her last year. But because you're in love with your draft picks and yourself... Oh, it's hard. This guy falls in love with his draft picks. Who gives a shit who they are? You're either good or you're not. This is pro ball, man. You either perform or you don't. This is not about a love affair. This is not about liking someone. I think sometimes you guys get that crossed. Liking and loving a player or liking his character and all that is like the fifth thing on the list. Can he play? Is he productive? Does he fit into our scheme? Is he smart? Does he do all that? Then they go, hey, if he's a great teammate, that's even better. It doesn't start with, is he a great guy? Is he a great teammate? It starts with, is he committed to the game? Does he love the game? Does he listen? Can he be coached? There's a lot of guys who are assholes who can be coached. Lawrence Taylor's the biggest asshole on the planet, but he could be coached with people he trusted. Parcells and Belichick were people he trusted. Didn't you notice after those guys left, he retired? Okay. Happens. Once Customato died for Tyson, it was over. It was over. There was nobody in his ear that gave him the reinforcement he needed. Tiger was never the same. After his incident in November with his wife. Happens. You lose commitment. Okay. Sills, you're like a doctor with a shitty bedside manner, but it doesn't make your diagnosis wrong. Hmm. Thank you. <laughs> Dean at safety. Come on, man. You're trying to find a spot for a guy who can't stay healthy and play. Why would you keep that guy on your feet? Howie Roseman is just telling you and showing you how committed he is to a failure pick in Dean. Let's do this. How, how about this? N'Kobe Dean plays great for two games. And then he's out for five because he's not big enough. Was that smart to start him? You're gambling. The entire season on defense is a gamble. And here, we're going to go into it. Let's start with Bryce Huff. And really, Devin White. And I'm going to agree with you guys on something here. Okay? I'm going to agree here. This thing is either going to be the biggest success on the planet with Devin White and Bryce Huff, or it's going to be the biggest failure since that Ray Carruth guy. What 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 was what was the guy that you got? Crothers? What was the guy you got from Washington? Who was the guy you guys got from Washington and you brought him down to Philly and he stunk? Okay. This is either gonna be like the biggest 
success or the biggest failure of all time. Kerrigan, thank you. Bob, Hollywood, thank you. It's either going to be one or the other. So you're gambling. Devin White, the guy still said midseason we could trade him and pay him $20 million for 10 years. Yeah, and then all of you sudden, because I don't really cover the Bucks. By the way, we got Ian Beckles on because he did go from that to being a complete and disaster. That's right, Chris. Congratulations. You can remember and read. I did say that. And then when you start covering the guy and then you watch him get beat out by a player and you saw him get beat out, he was a healthy scratch for the play. You signed a player who couldn't even start against you for the Bucks. You don't think that changes the narrative? And he was the fifth pick in the draft, and you signed him. You signed him anyway. So? You signed him anyway. The Bucks moved off him. Why are you thinking he's good? The look at Chris. Change your opinion after a half a season. Well, did you change your opinion on the Eagles when they were 10 and 1? Or no? You still thought they were a great team. Look at how stupid Chris's comments are because the league changes every week. So Chris's mentality is he still thinks the Eagles had a great year, even though they were 1 and 7 down the stretch, and he didn't change his opinion at all about Philadelphia or Hurts or anybody on the coaching staff or the team, and he thought the coordinators were great. Even when they went one and seven. According to Chris, oh, a terrible analogy because it doesn't fit your narrative. That's why it's terrible to Chris. Chris was sailing along like all of you were going, why is he ripping the coordinator? Why is he ripping Hurts? Why is he ripping this? They're 10 and one. But now all of a sudden, Chris didn't change his opinion and thought everything was okay. And like the way the season ended. That's a terrible narrative. That's a terrible analogy because it doesn't fit his narrative. See what I'm saying? The Eagles changed. Hey, Seals, I believe Devontae will be wide receiver than A.J. Owens pay him and trade Owens. Probably so. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm without a doubt. Dude, you were all, hey, wait a minute. You were all over the Eagles at 10 and 1. Were you not, Chris? Did that change for you? Let me guess. You were all over Wentz. Did that change for you or no? Did you flip-flop, Chris, on Wentz and this 10 and 1 season? No, he didn't. Now he's fucking lying. Now he's lying. Now he's lying. See what I'm saying? So you guys don't hold your own comments to your own narratives. Okay? You loved Wentz. Oh, okay. I effing loved Wentz, he says. So you didn't change your opinion on Wentz his last three seasons in Philly and said that he's he's losing it and lost it. You didn't change your opinion on him. You didn't change your opinion on him, on his play. Did you or did you not? Did you not flip-flop on Wentz? Yes or no, Chris? Slightly. He slightly changed his opinion, so he flip-flopped on Wentz. I, yeah, I loved Wentz. So do you still think he should be the starting quarterback for the Eagles if you love him so much? Would you take him over Hurts? Okay, Chris. Do you think he should be starting over Hurts, Chris? 
No. So you flip-flopped. You flip-flopped. Yes or no? Maybe. (laughs) Holy cow. I should have been a lawyer, Bill. Big Bill! Holy cow, I should have been a lawyer. (laughs) This is too easy. Oh, my God. (laughs) Dude, the guy just admitted to flip-flopping on Wentz. I wasn't a Hurts fan. But watch this. You flip-flopped on that too, Chris. You went from not being a Hurts fan to being one. That's a flip-flop too, isn't it? I don't call them flip-flops, just so you know. I call it a player getting better or worse. These takes are not in cement. No, Chris, so you're not a fan of Wentz? You don't think he, I mean, you're not a fan of Hurts? You don't think he got better? But Chris, wait a minute, Hollywood. Chris is not the only one that thinks like this. They're they're stuck in those old way sports hosts where their takes are in cement and then bronzed. I don't subscribe to that because I go with what the player and coach do. Okay? Chris, I'm not really bagging on you, but you flip-flop every day. I'm not an analyst. I'm not um, a journalist. I'm none of those things. I would never want to be considered one. Silio's reporting. Every time I see that, I laugh my ass off. I'm not reporting nothing. I don't report anything. I I don't report anything. So do you, Sills. You're damn right. If Lamar Jackson sucks in 2021 or 2022 and has a great 2023, do you know what they do? I'm awake. Are you supposed to have me say Lamar Jackson didn't play and he still sucks, even though he just won a second MVP by the age of 26? What kind of fucking take is that? I'm trying to help you guys here. You see, I'm a waker. You wants me to hold to my guns when a guy goes, I say this, 2023 or 2022, Lamar didn't play well. 2023 was the MVP. Congratulations. You turned your season around and you won your second MVP. That's not facts. That's not a flip-flop. That's the player performing or not performing. Holy cow. Dude, I'm not a mind reader. I am totally not a mind reader. Okay? Give me a break. So this Bryce Huff sign and this Devin White sign, why would Howie gamble like this? When he could have signed and he could have paid players that give him a better chance of success, why wouldn't he have done that? Why such a gamble? Devin White is a gamble. He has blown for five years and Huff can't stay on the field. Why? Because he's not good enough. What upside? That when when Joseph says upside, he's talking code for potential. Potential is something he's never done. Bryce Huff has never been a three down player in his entire career in the NFL. Why are you gambling? Sills, your show is the best thing to hit Philly. Sports since Mike Missinelli. Thank you. Thank you. I love the fact that all you guys and all you have your great sports talk hosts in the history of Philadelphia. And I love the fact that they're Paisans. 15 sacks, he says. He had 12, actually, Jack Bag. Here, what I'll say to you, okay? He was on the field 46% of the time in his career. And he's done it once. 
Reddick has done it four times. Okay? Four times. You're gambling by moving off of that guy and hoping he becomes Reddick when he's not. Big Sills. Jordan Davis. Little big, <laughs> little big horn. <laughs> hey, Earth. He's a two-down player too, man. Okay, he's a two-down player too. Yes, sir, baby. Look at all this gamble here. You gotta love it. Howie did not upgrade him. Howie has more question marks now. Howie has more question marks now on defense than he did a year ago. Is Devin White going to be, watch this, is Devin White going to be good or not? He hasn't been. I can't wait to talk to Ian Beckles. Ian played 10 years in the league too. And he covers the Bucks, And I can't wait to get him on. That'll be at 3.30. Herm Edwards at 4.30. And Randy Cross at 5.30. I can't wait to talk. By the way, as you notice, we get all players on. Guys who actually did something. And then sit around there with pens in the stands. I kind of like those guys, you know. Guys, and, and if you do have a pen, you got to be a Hall of Fame voter. I mean. Philly 500 is the only guy I really put on the program that I like that's not any one of those kind of guys. Because I don't just put anybody on. You got to be a bigger star than Big Sills. And if you're not, you know, you got to work your way up. Right, Junior? <laughs> Big Bill! Got to work your way up, baby. You sit in the room with me, man. Is how he at... Caleb Williams' is pro day, why would he be there? So he could be seen? Like he was over at uh, Kenny Pickett's day with his binoculars. His Joe Banner binoculars. Do we actually think Huff will be better than Reddick? Gabe, the Eagles are thinking and saying that with their analytics. Why would Howie not value what's in front of him? Amen. Xander was the first to point that out. Xander was the first to say, you got Reddick. Why'd you sign another guy? And you insult him by paying him more than Reddick. He's 25 and can't stay on the field. Congratulations, Chris. You signed a one down end. There you go, baby. Hey, but he's got potential. <laughs> He's got potential. Hey, trust me. When you see this guy in three years from now, three years from now, I want to know what he's going to look like three minutes from now. We'll see. No, we've already seen. His career with the Jets, we've already. No, it's going to magically change in Philly because what? The ghost of Jim Johnson? Okay. LJ brings a great point up. Why was Huff on your list? Because I thought you'd get Brian Burns and put him behind him. That makes sense. You get a top flight edge rusher like a Brian Burns, put him behind him. He sets the edge. You're not really in any kind of danger. You have no guys that know how to set the edge right now that are that are um, experienced in setting the edge. You're going to a 34 with shitty four linebackers. There you go. Yeah, okay. So LJ goes like this, bullshit. Of course he does. You know why? Doesn't fit his narrative. Because he thinks he knows more. That's fine. I don't have a problem with him thinking that. Okay? I don't have a problem with him. Just like he thought at 10-1, and 1, they were a Super Bowl contending team, and I kept telling you guys at 10-1, and 1, that team is not good. But, unfortunately, it all unraveled. Like I told you it would. And I told you that guy Dean would end up on IR, which it did, okay? And that's not something I'm glad for because nobody likes to cover sorry-ass teams, okay? Dave goes, Huff and Burns, right. Okay, you're right. 
because Howie doesn't pay for those type of players. He bargained basements. Let's take a look at that. Okay, how about this? Why did you sign Gardner Johnson when you could have signed Xavier McKinney? Because you didn't want to pay. Why did you sign Patrick Queen? Because you didn't want to pay and you signed Devin Huff, a dime store linebacker. Why didn't you sign Brian Burns? Because you didn't want to pay and you signed Bryce Huff. End of story. Get, get this. LJ goes, he was never on the radar. You're right. How he doesn't spend money in places that matter. And that's why your defense is a gamble. And it's a bigger gamble than last year. You have not addressed anything. Nothing. You have not addressed anything. Except this. More question marks. I wanted Burns too, but guess what? You got to remember, Barb, the, the zipper on the wallet. You see, you got to remember with the owners involved in this. And he likes big, shiny yachts. Did you see what the, hey, you guys see what the new name of the yacht is that Jeffrey Laurie bought? Did you see it? It's called the USS Saquon Barkley. Yeah, this brand new, this brand new yacht that Jeffrey Lurie bought. It's called the USS Saquon Barkley. He couldn't have it, the USS Devin White. Yeah, this is like the USS Saquon Barkley, because the owner likes those big offensive names. You know, the USS Saquon Barkley. <laughs> uh, the biggest question mark is not our players, but rather our scheme. No, no, it's not going to be. You hired a more experienced coordinator. It's not the scheme, it's your players. Just players on that side of the ball are not an upgrade. Okay. <laughs> the USS Saquon Barkley. No, the Saquon. That's what the new Jeffrey Lurie uh, yacht is. Or yacht? Is that how you guys say it, you rich guys? Xander would know. All you, all you rich guys know how to say yacht. I, I, to me, it's you know yacht. I don't know. I'm a just a blue collar guy. I don't know anything about that. All you, all you rich guys go yacht. You know, or yachtsman. This shit like that. It's these. It's the Saquon. This thing's great. Padded seats. <laughs> you gotta watch out for the seats on the Saquon though. The legs fall out from under it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, okay. How you doing? Dan, do you think there's more to the story with Reddick? Because it seems like it's more to that than just the money. I'm wondering if it was an issue in the life. No, you know what I think it really comes down to? I don't think Fangio likes him. As a player, not as a person. I don't think it's personal or anything like that. I, I I just think that Fangio doesn't think, and he'd rather coach a younger player. Okay? I think he'd rather coach a younger player. Yeah, the, the y'all, the Saquon. I like the Saquon. The only problem is the captain's chair, the legs fall out. <laughs> oh, oh, no. Holy cow. Yeah, the legs fall out. <laughs> yeah. There's a problem in the captain's chair. Those legs fall out, man. You know, under, under y'all, Saquon. Slagger comes down to money. The money It does, man. Unfortunately, Slagger, the Eagles don't spend on defense, and Reddick is at a point of his career where it costs too much. D yeah, right. And that's why they signed the same player, Slagger. Okay. But Howie would never sign a running back. No, I said Howie would never pay for a running back. And he did. But that wasn't the number one priority. You'll never re-sign Swift. You didn't. He went to Chicago for more money. 
I told you you'd never sign Swift. You'd never re-sign Swift. Yes, I'm right. I'm wrong about him paying for it back. Great. You paid for a broken down running back who's been injured three of the last four years. Okay. <laughs> and Swift, they offered Swift. Hey, by the way, dude, they offered Swift a contract. The Eagles, according to John McMullen, offered Swift a contract. According to more people, they actually offered him. He went to Chicago instead. I said you'd never re-sign him. How you doing? Boom. I Thank you, man. I hadn't thought of that. Right, right, right. <laughs> oh, yeah. You, we need defense? You still do. All right. Hertz is up next. Buckle up. Don't forget. Please do me a favor. Our dear friends at Underdog Fantasy, man. This is, we're looking for 500 folks here. Okay. Jacob Sports is looking for a select 500 folks from our loyal viewers and subscribers to partner up with Underdog Fantasy. We're really looking forward to this. We've got a ton of people already signed up here. The minimum is 10 bucks. Okay. And it'll go as high as a hundred bucks, which means they match it. Okay. And this is all throughout the tournament. I'm going to be involved with it for March Madness is turning. Now here's the big thing. You got to use the promo code win W I N for you to be involved in this great promotion. We need your help. We really appreciate you guys doing this. Thank you so much again. I look forward to it. Hey, don't forget Ian Beckles is going to join us at three 30 Eastern time part of the Buccaneer broadcasting team. And we'll ask him about Devin White. He covered him for the last six years. Let's see what he says. Let's let's see what he says about Devin White. Okay? Let's, let's get it from a former Buccaneer, 10-year NFL veteran. Also, too, don't forget, at 4.30, Herm Edwards is going to join us. And then at 5.30, Randy Cross will join us. Hit the like button. Keep it here, National Football Show. Underdog Fantasy is the easiest place to play fantasy sports and certainly the easiest when you're watching the NBA and the NBA playoffs are almost here and you can win money making picks. What are you waiting for? Sign up on underdogfantasy.com and use the promo code WIN. An underdog will double your first deposit up to $100. That's underdogfantasy.com. Use the promo code WIN. Get ready for the NBA and get ready for the NBA playoffs. Go to underdogfantasy.com. Use the promo code WIN. Philadelphia fans were cut from a different cloth. Born into a brotherhood and bonded to our team for life. We believe anything is possible because we've witnessed the impossible. While we may be from different neighborhoods, come Sunday, we are one and we will be heard. Pondley Hockey, official partner of the Philadelphia Eagles. Hi everybody, my name is Jason Lombardi. I'm an inspector at DryTech. At DryTech we offer three major services. The first one being basement waterproofing. The second service we offer is foundation and structural repairs. And then the third service that we offer is mold remediation. If you feel you are having a waterproofing issue, give DryTech a call or check us out online. Mike Little was a union construction worker who was badly, badly injured when he suffered a horrific fall because of someone's negligence. His life would change forever. It was just a real downward spiral with everything. Everything you do, and you're sitting home by yourself all day. Have no, you know, you can't go out because you can't drive, you can't walk well. It was just a horrible situation. 
Call Brian Fritz at the Fritz and Beyond Cooley Law Firm at 215-548-2222. E-A-G-L-E-S. Eagles. Big Sales National Football Show. Appreciate you coming aboard. Ian Beckles will join us at the bottom of the hour. Um, I'll tell you what I would be doing now if I was an NFL team and I was watching what Sean McVay did when it came to quarterbacks. The Eagles suck at evaluating quarterbacks. Since 2000, it's been a junkyard of quarterbacks. It's just been a junkyard. You've had three in 25 years and really kind of went and then kind of hurts right now. We'll see what happens this year. It could go in a different, Hey, I don't know what direction it'll go. Will he be the same guy? Will he be 2022 or will he be 2023? Still the question mark. You don't know that. Nobody knows it right now. Okay. There's nothing consistent about the quarterback position and how the Eagles evaluate it. But there's one thing that if I were a team, this is what I would be doing. I would look at what Sean McVay is doing. And every quarterback that he brings in or he works with goes on to have exceptional success. Okay? Think about it. So he inherits Jared Goff and takes Jared Goff to a Super Bowl. And he's schools and teaches Jared Goff what it takes to play the position at quarterback. You could make the argument that the Rams gave up too soon on him. They're working on a new contract in Detroit. Take a look at that. I don't know if I've ever seen a situation where a trade of a quarterback has benefited both people. Okay? Has benefited both people. Goff's working on a new deal. He used golf to get to a Super Bowl, okay? Look at Matthew Stafford. This guy had an under 500 record as a starting quarterback with one playoff win in Detroit. What does he do? He comes to Los Angeles and wins a Super Bowl. Why? Because McVay's schooling and teaching him the position. Then, look at what he had with Baker Mayfield. Baker Mayfield was in Los Angeles, gave him some schooling, helped him out on playing the position, Baker Mayfield has just signed a three-year, $100 million deal. I have to think the guy in Los Angeles knows what he's doing when it comes to quarterbacks. Every guy he's worked with. I don't know what's going to happen with Wentz. I know they just signed Garoppolo. Every single guy that Sean McVay has worked with in Los Angeles has gone on to greener pastures. That's knowing the position. That's knowing how to develop the position. Unlike the Eagles, who ruin the position by hiring incompetent people around you. There's nothing incompetent about Sean McVay and what he's done with the quarterbacks that he's worked with. Look at Nick Sirianni and how he works with quarterbacks and then turn around and look at what McVay does with quarterbacks. There lies the direct difference between an incompetent guy and a competent guy. You can't have it any more clearer than that. The Eagles have a coach who's not even good enough to be on that Los Angeles Rams coaching staff. And you have him as your head coach. And you think he's going to help Jalen Hurts' growth as a head coach in Philadelphia. Not sure what you're looking at here with your boy. It just doesn't make sense. Do you understand that Nick Sirianni hurts Jalen Hurts? 
And why is that? Because he's not teaching Jalen Hurts the position. He's relaying a mentality and a message from the front office. That's not coaching. That's not coaching. That's going along. That's why he had nothing to do with the Super Bowl run. You can't have two extremes. And you know why you can't? Because when you take quality people away from Sirianni, it exposes him. 23 expose Sirianni for what he is. He's incompetent. Completely incompetent. And immature. And here, before we get Ian Beckles on, talk about your second boy wonder, Devin White. Okay? Are the Eagles making a mistake? By taking Hertz's legs away from his career. Yes or no? Are they hurting Hertz's career by taking his legs away? Thank you, Chad. Yes. So when they're working this offseason here and they're working in OTAs and they're going to have a camp here soon, they're going to get further away from that, which is going to mean that Hurts is further away from being an elite quarterback because he's not an elite passer. So how, like I just said about Sirianni and the organization, they're destroying Hurts the same way they destroyed Carson Wentz. This will be slower. You know why? Because Jalen is stronger willed. Wentz wasn't. It imploded quicker with Wentz because of Wentz's thinking. Jalen, it will be harder to break him down. But it's only a matter of time before they break him down too. Because you can't have that much talent on offense. You can't and fail. And I think Barb hit on it just now. The signing of Barkley was a signal to that thinking. If Hertz can't turn it around, we'll just hand the ball off more. Amen, Barb. That's exactly correct. And if Hertz sucks... We'll just give Kenny Pickett in there, and he could turn around and hand the ball to Barkley. They're not going to hang on that position because the money that's invested here. Okay? You sign a running back. You st- Here, let me ask you this. Here. If he starts having high turnovers... Jalen Hurts this year because they're throwing the ball more and they're getting away from taking his legs out from under him. Do you think they're going to continue throwing the ball or do you think they're going to turn to Barkley to try to save the season by handing the ball off more? Or will they stick with their mentality and ego and continue to throw the ball even though he has a high turnover rate? They're going to continue to do that until the bitter end. How do you think that will go if he does that? I think Barb's right. He's a fail-safe. If Jalen doesn't play well, and this thing's 500 by week eight, they're just going to turn themselves back into a running team. Here's Philly 007. If he has eight turnovers by week seven, does he get replaced? 
That's a big admit, a, a 007. If they ever took Jalen Hurts out of a game and benched him, there'd be holy hell to pay. Because that would be the second quarterback in six years that you gave a contract to that you benched. That is that is going to be a very tough. You could have benched Jalen Hurts at any time last year in that one and seven run. You could have benched him at any time. Any time you could have benched him. He was playing poorly, especially at the back end of that. But they didn't because they know what the look is. And remember something about observations on how the Eagles don't like to look poorly or have any kind of criticism towards them, especially their owner and GM. My God almighty. You talk about sensitive people. If you think AJ Owens is sensitive, their GM is even more sensitive along with their owner. It's quite remarkable that people are billionaires and millionaires are that sensitive like that to what I say. It's crazy. My bosses can't put their phones down sometimes. And get this, that can't, I just can't be the only guy. I, I, I just can't be the only guy. Or maybe I am. I don't know. That's a great take, John. Look what John just said. John, it's a great comment. And you don't even know, basically. Or maybe you do because you made the comment. I'm not going to do that to you and dilute what you're thinking. Because unlike LJ or some of these other people, I don't know what you're thinking. So I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt. Okay? See, look at Chris. Chris goes like this. Oh, my F and G. God sales. Get off your high wagon. No, you have no idea what you're talking about. I get calls from that damn organization weekly. Oh, I don't. My bosses do. That's a fact. It's a fact. It's not a high horse. No one likes that call. If you think I'm gloating over that, I'm not. I'm talking about the sensitivity. Sure, you want So look at this guy here, uh, Chris. He wants to make that about me. The Eagles calling my bosses up, complaining about what I'm saying about their general manager and coaching and the quarterback decisions, and wants to make that about me complaining about it when they're calling my bosses trying to get me fired. How's that about me? It's about your sensitive organization. Okay? It's about your sensitive organization. I've never seen anything like it, actually. Even the Bucks didn't act like that towards me. You know what the Bucks did? Either he goes or I go. And that's why they came up with that story. The Tampa Bay Buccaneers in 2012 told Clear Channel, Either he goes or I go. That's why I was fired. Not the monkey comment. I was fired because the Bucks told him to. Either he goes or we go. And I have the email from the program director that I posted on my Twitter page. Go look it up. Nobody at Clear Channel wanted to fire Dan. It was pressure from the Bucks. That's not really well known. Now it is. Okay. Hey, Anthony, I don't mind people protecting their brand. I don't. Hey, don't hey, just so you know, guys. The University of Miami, when they had an athletic director, see? When they had an athletic director by the name of Brad James, and they had a head coach in there, you know Al Golden? They had me barred from the campus because I was talking shit on the air about the team not being good and Al Golden sucking as a coach. I was critical of my favorite team in sports. 
So it's not just something that I do with the Eagles. You're either going to win championships or you're not. You either are a championship mentality or you're not. Silver medals and bronze medals and regular season games don't mean shit to me. You're either going to win titles or you're not. What are you rooting for if you're not rooting to win a Lombardi trophy? Being decent? Rooting for 500? What do you root for? Okay? Alex goes, what are you going to do when the Eagles come for you? Go knee deep harder. What do you think? I hide under my desk like people in politics do? Not happening. I don't hide under my desk. Okay? Sills, you've never made the playoffs. Shut up. Oh, yes, I have. I made the playoffs in, let's see. I made it in the World League with the NFL owned that, by the way, all the way to the championship game. And we also did in the Arena League. I think we, we have we we I think we won how many games? Three? Something like that. Okay. What are you rooting for if you're not rooting to be great? Sills, it was Donna Shalala who had you banned from UM. She wanted to be the Stanford of the South, Donna Shalala, the man who allowed um, Devin Shapiro, Nevin Shapiro to give her a check for $187,000 from a Ponzi scheme that bankrupted many people in the South Florida and around the country in their pension funds. And she took $187,000 and had it right there so that he could run out of the smoke and out of the tunnel at the Orange Bowl. Sold our souls, sold us, she sold us out, and then she put that piece of shit, Barry Alvarez, in charge. What would Barry Alvarez know about winning titles? What would he know? What would he know about the Miami way? Nothing. He had no understanding about Miami football, and the local kids in that area from Bell Glades, Overtown, Liberty City, had no idea what it was like for those kids that Miami was a place of hope. It sold hope to kids who didn't have it. The only black faces we had in Coral Gables were on the football team. And Jimmy and Howard Schnellenberger gave them hope to get them out of their poverty. You'd be shocked at the impoverished situation that many of those kids played in. Miami doesn't do that shit anymore. They don't recruit in those areas any longer because the university's afraid. That's why Miami sucks. They recruit suburban kids now instead of kids who have no way out except for success. I appreciate you guys. We're having a little internet issues here again. I don't know what's up. Um, we appreciate you guys here. Thank you so much here. We're going to get Ian Beckles on here in a couple minutes. Um, yeah, I just, so it's not just something that is isolated to you guys. When is the Dan Cave moving here to Australia? I'll tell you something, Anton. If my daughter makes... Uh, one of the rugby league teams, Xander's going to have to get up an awful earlier for me to be able to do that, okay? Because if she makes an Australian rugby team, your boy Big Sills will be there. McDonald's Wi-Fi. No, no, no. My Wi-Fi. Have you heard the company? Uh, it, it, it's called the Newsome Wi-Fi. It's Newsome Wi-Fi. You know, he has to shut it down every certain time during the day because, you know, the electric bill and, you know, California, man, they got to shut off the power grid every now and then just to save the damn thing and to save the state. Okay. I mean, it's called the Newsome Wi Fi. <laughs> Hope your daughter makes a team, Sells. Hey, my daughter's in the championships, man. They're the number one ranked team in the country right now. Wow, we have fans from Australia. Isn't that great? 
Hey, I'll tell you what, too. People in Australia, they're probably like people in Philly, too. Okay? Sills, what's going on at Jacob Medium? Great. NCAA March Madness Tournament's here. Thank you very much, guy. Jacob Sports is looking for a select 500 folks of our loyal viewers and subscribers. <laughs> That's what we're doing here. All right. Having a little Wi-Fi little Wi-Fi issues here, but we're gonna get it all cleaned up here. But don't forget, Herm Edwards is gonna join us at 4 30. And we're also gonna get Randy Cross with us at 5 30 Eastern time, and we'll talk to him. Man, when I was on the air in Tampa with this dude, holy cow, was WDAE the most powerful radio station in the East Coast? Former Buccaneer. And my friend, and I'll tell you what, I love his work. Ian Beckles joins us now. Ian, how you doing, big fella? I still got a bunch of your T-shirts, man. You gave me back in the day. I still got them T-shirts, dude. I'm doing well, brother. How are you? You look good, man. Thank you, man. You too, man. How's it going, Ian? Life is good, bro. I'm 56 years old. I ain't no spring chicken no more. Um, you know, still involved with radio a little bit. I'm on the Bow 1025, do some stuff with Mike Calta and do podcasts. And I want to call the bar and uh, keep myself busy, man. Hey, man, did we not kill it in Tampa on DA? Hey, well, I, look, I liked you and Ron, you know, the other guy in the afternoon. Me and him never really got along, you know, God rest his soul, all this and that. But that day, Chris Thomas, before you guys, man, that was a really great time in radio, man, when we had that station doing 10 shares across the board. Yeah, that was a good time in the history of sports radio. I think it's fallen a little bit since. Uh, we, ha we had an unbelievable lineup. Um, the, the young man, uh, Steve Dooming, you talk about in the afternoon. Uh, I mean, like you said, rest in peace. I don't think he conducted himself uh, that he wanted to be too many people's friends. But uh, his radio was good. Yeah. Uh, it, was, it was controversial. And, you know, we didn't kiss nobody's ass. That was beautiful. Absolutely. Ian, I want you to help me out on something here. Help me out on Devin White. There's some people in Philadelphia that are excited about him. And yet when I hear Sapp say this, he was lazy. The last five years have not been good. And the Bucks picked him at the fifth pick and just allowed him to walk out the room. Now, it's one thing to hear Sapp say, you kind of take it with a small grain of salt, but one thing about Warren, he's got harsh criticism. Do you have the same criticism of Devin White? Well, I mean, I know Warren personally, and Warren uh, doesn't pull punches. Uh, and listen, he was a captain for the Buccaneers, so, you know, I, I think he understands the game of football, as we all do. Um, I don't think he said anything about Devin White that isn't the truth. Uh, Devin White is an unbelievable athlete. He's an unbelievable talent. I wouldn't say that the whole five year, years was a bust. He was a big reason why they won the Super Bowl. He was great that year. And Devin White has had periods where he looked fantastic. Now, if you ask me if Devin White is a great football player, I could not say he's a great football player. I can say he's an explosive football player with a lot of potential, but he's missing something. I don't know if it's a sports psychologist because there's sometimes he just doesn't seem like he remembers what he's doing, if that makes sense. Like, there's times he's just being blocked. The great ones are never blocked. You know that, Dan. Like, Derek Brooks always knew where he was in the moment, and that's what I grew up seeing. And Devin White at times just kind of seems like he's going out for a Sunday stroll. So physically, mentally, I think physically he's all, he seems fine. Mentally, I think the kid needs some work. So he's an emotional player then, Ian. If things are going great, he's great. If things are going bad, maybe in his life, because last year, one thing I did notice, this guy at the beginning of the year, when he said he wanted a new contract, his, his market value was off the charts. And then all of a sudden, when things weren't going right with Jason Light, the general manager of the Bucks, I even talked to Bruce Arians about this and had him on the show. It just seemed that he went south the other way and things unraveled to the point, Ian, where he was benched at the end of the season. So, I mean, he's more emotional than anything, isn't it? Well, I think he thought his market value was much higher than it actually was. And listen, as athletes, we have, I have no problem with thinking somebody's worth more money than they are. 
at the beginning of last year, if you'd have put him out in the open market, I don't think there would have been a bunch of people running to, to sign Devin White, to be honest with you. If Devin White would have had a solid year this year, I think he would have got paid a lot more than he did. He's just not a $20 million guy. There's not many middle linebackers in the league that are right now. I can think of a couple, and that's it. Devin's a serviceable football player. And listen, I used to be an Eagle as well. I claim to be a Buccaneer. I'm a Buccaneer until I die. But I wouldn't say the Eagles got a bust. I mean, if, if his mind is right and, he's, and, and his body's right, you can get a good football player in Devin White if, but the, like I said, something was missing in Tampa Bay. He, did, he, he didn't play very inspired at times, and I wondered why. Um, you think a new, like you said, Ian, do you think a new zip code, maybe under Fangio in a new environment, kind of helps him out more with a new, with a new uh, slate? And this is something that, again, they're going to – what I looked today, I found out because Clint Hurt is a former Kane and he's a former D.C. up in Seattle, and he's now the D-line coach. And they're going to go to a 34. They're going to put him in a 34, which means he's got to play on a guard. So that means he's got to play the run. And, Ian, those numbers have not looked real good when it comes to playing against the run. Can he handle a 34? Uh, if you're asking me my vote, I would say no. I mean, if you say – give me a 34 linebacker, Devin White wouldn't be the first one that comes to mind. You know, back in the day, Dad, those 34 linebackers were in, you know, the Oak of Ray Lewis's and Big Bird. LeVon guys. Kirkland's, yeah, LeVon yeah. Kirkland kind of guys. Yeah, and you don't have to be huge guys. Sam Mills was a good inside yeah. linebacker who was a son of a bitch at like 5'9". But listen, Devin White, phys physicality is not really his thing. He's a runner. He runs side to side. If he has to take on linemen, that's not really his forte. Um, unless they can figure out a way to hide him. If he's just taking on guards all, all day long, I just don't think that's really playing to his strengths, but I, we'll see. Let me ask you about the Bucks a little bit here. You know, a couple of years ago, this guy's not doing anything, and he's going on to his fourth team when he signs with the Bucks, and that's Baker Mayfield. I mean, what, what a transformation, you know? I mean, Ian, he goes from being like a third, fourth team guy in Los Angeles with Sean McVay now he signs a three-year, $100 million contract. The Bucs probably didn't want to restart the whole cycle again at quarterback and didn't really get comfortable with the people that were in the draft. I mean, um, what did you make of the signing of – re-signing of Baker Mayfield and giving him that contract extension? Well, last year when the Bucs signed Baker Mayfield, I mean, my sentiment was, let's go, we get anything from this guy. It's, it's a positive because we have to get $4 million, Okay. Nobody was making $4 million a quarterback at the time. So, you know, we got him off a trash heap. Uh, and that's what I said. I said, we're getting this guy off a trash heap. You know, what can you expect? And people were like, well, you didn't think. I was telling you the way it was, okay? I was telling you what Baker Mayfield was. And what he was was a, a huge project. If anybody was in the Baker Mayfield camp, and there was a lot of people, that's fine. I don't think you could have imagined him playing that well. I just, even if you were a fan of Baker Mayfield, he played his ass off last year. His statistics were better than Tom Brady's in his last year. Tom Brady wouldn't have played better than Baker Mayfield last year in the same situation. I'm to a point where if we had had that Baker Mayfield the year before, the Bucks would have been better than they were with Tom Brady because Tom Brady was at the end of it. Now, I'm, I seem crazy for saying that because I. No, no, I, you're right. So, I know it's right, but you never would have thought that two, three years ago. But Baker Mayfield helped make this Buccaneer a playoff team last year, and the Bucs are in a situation where now he's not a $4 million quarterback anymore. He's a $30-something million quarterback, and we'll see if he's worth it. At $4 million is a steal of the year. At $33 million, you're going to have to play better than last year, and I'm not sure he's capable. But if you told me right now he's going to play exactly like he played last year, I would take it right now. Help me out on Todd Bowles. I'm from afar, and again, Ian, I'm not on top of the Bucks anymore like you are when you cover them, you know, on a, on a daily basis. And I look at Todd Bowles, and I see a Tony Dungy type of guy, a guy who's not going to get too high and a guy who's not going to get too low. And when you're a player, let the players be emotional. I don't want my head coach to be emotional. And when you guys were at the beginning of the year, because the Eagles – beat them pretty handily. Then at the end of the year, the Bucs beat the Eagles handily. And I'm sitting there thinking, 
That's coaching, in my opinion. And I love Todd Bowles. And I'm glad that the Glazers, Jason Light, they didn't move on from him. Are you? Well, you know, I, I do a podcast in the trenches, and I talk about Todd Bowles quite often. And I find myself defending him too much, okay? Because, listen, I'm not a fan of anybody. I just evaluate people, and that's it. I don't know Todd Bowles. If he walked in this room, I, I would say, hey, Todd, how you doing? I don't know him. I saw Jason Light the other day. I said to Jason Light, hey, buddy, I think you're doing a fantastic job. There's times where I was eviscerating Jason Light, and he deserved it. But if you look at Todd Bowles and what he's done throughout the years, I don't know how anybody would not be a fan. I really don't. I mean, I think everybody wants the Sean McVeighs and the Sean Paytons and all these, you know, colorful cats that roll the – how about somebody that the players are playing for? And to me, Todd Bowles, like you said, this team clearly – improved as the year went on. I don't think this team was that talented last year, but they certainly were playing hard for somebody. And Todd Bowles, to me, gets as, as much as you can out of as little as he has. And right now, I'm not sure we could be in better hands than Todd Bowles. Are they going to win a Super Bowl? I'm not sure they have enough talent, but are they good hands with Todd Bowles? I say 100%. You know, Ian, I think, you know, I didn't realize this until I looked it up like midway through the year last year when it came to what Mike Evans has done. I didn't realize that Mike Evans, every year he's been in the league, has had 1,000 yards. He's on his way to Canton. There was a conversation, I think maybe someone threw it out there, that the Bucks were going to move on from him and they were going to let him go somewhere. And I'm like, why would you let one of the top three receivers in the league go? He's still great. He's still performing. And now that you had Mayfield come back, I think the signing of Mike Evans, bringing him back, I think that was just collateral when it came over to having to sign Baker Mayfield. Because if it, you don't sign Evans, you're not signing Mayfield. Do you agree? Well, there's, I believe in this one word called karma, okay? If they didn't re-sign Mike Evans, I'm not sure the karma would be right. You know, yeah. Mike Evans... I'm wrong about, and I say when I'm wrong. I, I'm wrong often. I've been on the radio and I've been on doing podcasts forever. I've been wrong about Mike Evans probably for the last four years. Every year I have to say the same thing. Well, you can't expect Mike Evans to be the same guy. And he's the same guy every year. So <laughs> going into this year, my mentality is you can't keep on doing this. But if Mike Evans has another great year, once again, I won't be shocked. I just think if the Bucks didn't have Mike Evans this year, it would have been a bad feel. It would have felt like the, the rebuilding year. And as long as Mike Evans is on the field, as long as Levante David, who was resized back on the field, now we have Baker Mayfield. You're going to see a lot of Evans and Mayfield, Levante David jerseys. It's not going to feel like we're rebuilding. We're not going to win a Super Bowl this year. It's probably not going to happen. But we have a chance. And there's not a lot of other teams that going into the season can say, hey, we have a chance, and we're one of them. Couple last questions for you, Ian. Um, Bucks needs in the draft. You know, I love Via Veda. And obviously, now that you lose White, linebacker, would you say on that side of the ball, or maybe offensive line on the other side of the ball would be a need for the Bucks? Well, I mean, I'm always a trenches guy, Dan. You know that. That's where the games are won. Um, Vita Vea, I'm going to say this about Vita Vea. Sometimes I love him, sometimes I don't. Huh. Because, first of all, he's not always present. He misses too many games. Your boy Warren Sapp, you brought up earlier, when he drafted, when we drafted Vita Vea, he looked, he, we had a conversation the next day, and he said, Beck, he'll never play 16 games at that size. And I'm not sure he has. So, Vita Vea needs to stay healthy. He's banged up too much. And, you know, you got to be there for 17. That's, that's, yeah. To me, if you're great, you got to be there for 17. I played with Brooks and Sapp and those guys that were there all the damn time. As far as needs go, uh, I'd like to see the Buccaneers maybe they could use some more speed, tight end, running back. I mean, there's nothing we don't really need. I mean, you got to start thinking about tomorrow on quarterback and how high do you go. Clearly, Kyle Trask is not the guy, clearly, or else we'd have seen him a little bit. So they got to start thinking about the future of the quarterback because, you know, you can't expect Baker Mayfield to be the guy three years from now. So. I don't know there's a position the Buccaneers don't need at this moment. Let me get your take on Jalen Hurts. 
you saw him twice last year. Um, had kind of a walk back year last year, 18 turnovers. And, and Ian, go with me on this, or maybe you're not going to. I say this about dual threat quarterbacks. I don't think you can win a Super Bowl with these guys because to me, I think there's a ceiling. Either it's a health ceiling or it's a predictability ceiling. I think Lamar Jackson, when you throw the ball 47 times, Lamar Jackson's not winning a Super Bowl if he throws the ball 47 times. That guy's got to use his wheels. And to me, I think it's a hit-miss proposition on what a guy does year to year versus that seven-step guy. A seven-step guy, you've got to win a Super Bowl from the pocket. Or in your opinion, has that thinking changed? Um, I'm, I kind of agree with you, Ben, as far as you know that run-first mentality. It's not so much the game planning against it is physically you run out. I mean, like Cam Newton is the only quarterback that really took his team to the quarter to the Super Bowl running the football. He, I can't think of any other that did it. Now, when he got there, he was out of gas. I mean, that's too many hits to take. Josh Allen, every time I watch the Buffalo Bills play, I go, man, this guy's a talent, but he gets tackled too much. There's something about a quarterback getting tackled to me that just makes me cringe. I only saw Peyton Manning get tackled five times in his whole career. You know, that, like, that's how you preserve yourself. Baker Mayfield, the one knock I had on him, you, you're doing too much. Baker Mayfield, when he was in Cleveland, all I remember him is having, you know, straps around his shoulders and he's a beat-up warrior. I don't want my quarterback to be a beat-up warrior. I want my quarterback to make good decisions. And Lamar Jackson, uh, that's great in week 7, 8, 9, 10. But when week 17, 18, 19, 20 come, man, your wheels are gone, bro. And then you got to get back to you know, winning games in the pocket and maybe you're not quite used to that. So I'm okay with a quarterback that runs like a Jalen Hurts, but don't get hit. Russell Wilson used to run, but not get hit. You just got to have that kind of happy median, and you just got to take care of these young guys because it's a long-ass season. Absolutely. Ian, it's been so great to catch up with you, my friend. I know you're an entrepreneur in that town, and you're revered, and I I am so happy to reconnect with you here. Um, we used to see each other each and every single day. Ron, you, I think Ron, I know that's always, always sure Ron liked me, but hey, you know, I, I'm, I'm a – I'm an appetite for certain people, you know. Ian. <laughs> well, I'm not sure Ron like me. <laughs> <laughs> Ian, I love you, man. Thank you, brother. One love, brother. Be good. You got it. Our dear friend, Ian Beckles. Love talking with him. All right, folks, do me a favor. Hit the like button. And don't forget also our March Madness event. Jacob Sports, we are looking for 500 folks. And some of our loyal viewers and subscribers were teaming up with Underdog Fantasy. Now, look, it's simple. Ten bucks. That's it. You get ten bucks, they're going to match your ten bucks. Go all the way up to a hundred bucks. Great friends at Underdog Fantasy are there for you during this March Madness tournament. Simple. All you do is use the promo code WIN, W-I-N. That's W-I-N. That's the promo code. Don't forget, Herm Edwards is going to join us at 4.30 Eastern time. We will have Randy Cross at 5.30. Keep it here, National Football Show. Underdog Fantasy is the easiest place to play fantasy sports and certainly the easiest when you're watching the NBA. And the NBA playoffs are almost here, and you can win money making picks. What are you waiting for? Sign up on underdogfantasy.com and use the promo code WIN. An underdog will double your first deposit up to $100. That's underdogfantasy.com. Use the promo code WIN. Get ready for the NBA and get ready for the NBA playoffs. Go to underdogfantasy.com. Use the promo code WIN.
Philadelphia fans were cut from a different cloth. Born into a brotherhood and bonded to our team for life. We believe anything is possible because we've witnessed the impossible. While we may be from different neighborhoods, come Sunday, we are one and we will be heard. Pondley Hockey, official partner of the Philadelphia Eagles. Hi everybody, my name is Jason Lombardi. I'm an inspector at DryTech. At DryTech, we offer three major services. The first one being basement waterproofing. The second service we offer is foundation and structural repairs. And then the third service that we offer is mold remediation. If you feel you are having a waterproofing issue, give DryTech a call or check us out online. Mike Little was a union construction worker who was badly, badly injured when he suffered a horrific fall because of someone's negligence. His life would change forever. It was just a real downward spiral of everything. Everything you do, and you're sitting home by yourself all day. Have no, you know, you can't go out because you can't drive, you can't walk well. It was just a horrible situation. Call Brian Fritz at the Fritz & Beyond Cooley Law Firm at 215-548-2222. E-A-G-L-E-S, Eagles. Big sales. I saw a um, A.J. Owens workout video. Love those workout videos, too. I mean, I was watching it. I saw Hurts, too, you know? in the gym working out working on all the things that he needs to work on good man you know I, I shouldn't be goofing on that i did the same shit okay it's all good man hey by the way this is what i'll take from what what ian said it's exactly what i said about devin white you're either going to get a player who's going to show up or you're not but if you're Howie, why gamble on something like that? Why would you sign a player that has that identity that if he shows up, you got something? But if he doesn't, it's a dud. That's the story of Howie Roseman building a defense. It's hit or miss. Why do you not go? I would rather go. Okay, I would rather go with a lesser talented guy who gives me consistency like TJ Edwards. Get this. Let's throw this out here. How many people, get this. See, I'm awake. Are you 130 tackles and three sacks? And the buck said, no, thank you. He answers his own question. He answers his own question. Why would the Bucs say no to that? I'm not praising him. I'm not. I am not. It's a shit sign. How about this? Who would you rather have, Devin White or TJ Edwards? Who would you rather have? Watch this one. You want, you want to see stupidity at its finest? Watch this. Who would you rather have on your football team right now? And you know what? The people that can't answer it don't want to. Xander's like TJ all day long. Is he as talented? No. Is he as athletic? No. Here's LJ. White won a Super Bowl. So him. He'd rather have the lesser player. He's the lesser player. He's the lesser player. But see, certain people in here want to make their narrative correct. You know better than that. You'd rather have TJ all day because, one, he shows up every day. White doesn't. 
I have brought people on the program who cover the team now. I have told you what Sapp said about the player. Even the even the Eagles contract dictates that you don't believe it. Why don't you believe it? Your boy Eagle, he didn't say that. He said he helped and was on that team in his second year. If he's so instrumental, why did the Bucks let a 26-year-old guy who they picked fifth in the draft go? Why? My God almighty, you guys will try to make Howie Roseman into a God no matter at what expense, and you all are dumb who think that that guy White was a success when they kicked his ass out. You've got to be kidding me. You've got to be kidding that you would sit in here and try to make a narrative up that's not true. Seals, well, I don't think you're wrong about TJ. I don't think TJ can play over a guard in a 34 either. Bob, I'll tell you one thing he can do. He can play the run. You heard Ian Beckle say, when it comes to playing the run, Devin White's not the first guy I would sign. And you're playing a 34. You're actually putting Devin White in a position of failure. You're not even seeing the clarity in this. The Eagles are making a tremendous mistake by going to a 34 defense with Devin White and N'Kobe Dean. One guy can't stay healthy, and one guy can't tackle. I can't do any more and tell you any more than what people who cover the team, people who know the player. I should probably get Ed Ogeron on, guy who recruited him at LSU, so that maybe you'll understand how he rose and signed a guy that's not a fit for your defense. That's the point, LJ. Listen what LJ says. Let's see what White does this year. Okay? Why gamble? Why not sign a better player? Why not sign a 34 linebacker? He's not a 34 linebacker. Your depth chart is 34. You're a 3-4 now. I got this from Clint Hurd himself. You're playing a 34. You know what? Get this. LJ goes the entire league's a gamble. Well, shit, I'll take the Pittsburgh Steelers gamble on a three-year, $17.8 million deal with Patrick Queen versus a guy who's at a one-year tryout deal that has all question marks on effort, mentality, and playing the run. All facts. Get this. Blah, blah, blah. Of course, that's what he hears. That's what some of you Eagle guys hear. And your efforts to make Roseman look like he's had a great offseason so far on defense, you'll lie to yourselves. You'll lie to yourselves. Get this. Arthur goes, he was the captain of the Bucks. Yeah, they fired the captain. They fired him. They mutinied on the captain on the buck boat, threw him over for someone else, and he was benched by the end of the year. They mutinied on him. Get this. You got to be kidding me. That guy has not, he's downgraded your defense. And you'll sit here and lie to yourselves. The national media are praising the names that are being barked out. Huff, White, Barkley, are they fits? How come all the great teams don't make moves? 
but the Eagles make massive moves. I don't think White is only a veteran guy. I think Howie wants a linebacker in the draft that's more permanent and one of our own. Expectations for White is to be determined. So you signed a guy like that was my topic. It's a massive gamble. Huff and White are gambles. Every single person that has talked about Devin White has said he's not good in coverage. Do you know quarterbacks last year had a 110 quarterback rating versus him with him on pass defense? That's good. Zach Cunningham and Nicholas Murrow were better. Where is this massive upgrade? Okay, where is this massive upgrade? Where? Who's everyone? The Buck staff? Yeah. Bruce Arians told me the same shit. He's the senior vice president of the team about Devin White. You just heard a guy who covers the Bucks, part of the broadcast team. Yeah. 10 year veteran himself as a player. Sap says the same thing about him. He's lazy and he doesn't play all the time and he cries and moans. And that's who you got as your linebacker. That's not a gamble. Get the fifth pick in the draft and you're telling me you've upgraded and you're listening to the national media talking about your football team when you know they're all full of shit. You've got to be kidding me. Sales, how he has his plan and he believes that players are interchangeable. He hired a DC that has his plan. And those two plans don't line up. This could be a round peg in a square hole. Yeah, he believes in plug and play. He See, you got to understand, that's not how you build a football team. How he doesn't have professionals on his team. He's got plug and play dudes on defense. Why don't they do the same shit on defense that they do on offense? Is that by the owner, you think? Okay. <clears throat> Is that by the owner? Is that by the owner? You think the owner wants to spend money on that side? So Richard says I'm full of shit when I just pointed out what the whole world knows about Devin White. And the whole world knows what Ian just said about the guy. You don't believe it. You didn't believe a guy who actually was watching the guy for six years. And covers the team and a former buck. You are going on the word of Howie Roseman. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. <laughs> Literally unbelievable. How incompetent. Yeah, you know, it's it's like talking to Nick Sirianni in here. Some of you are the most incompetent people I've ever spoken to, and most of you are some of the best I've ever. It's just ridiculous how you try to make Nicobe Dean and Devin White into superstar players when you know they're not. Incredible. Incredible. Absolutely insane. We had some nice free agents. Where? They're all dime store cheap signs. You didn't get the preeminent player at any position in this offseason. And the guy you signed on day one, you signed him to replace Reddick. Okay? Crazy. Herm Edwards. 
is going to join us at 4.30 Eastern time. Also, Randy Cross is going to join us at 5.30. Don't forget our good friends with March Madness. It's here, Jacob Sports. And us are looking for a bunch of people. People here, we're looking forward to this with our great viewers and subscribers. Underdog Fantasy is teaming up with us. And minimum of 10 bucks, you sign up during the tournament. Great way to play along. You can go all the way up to 100 bucks. Very simple. So if you invest 10 bucks, they give you 10, you got 20. You put 100 in, you get 200. Simple as that. Remember, Underdog Fantasy, you got to use the promo code WIN. W I N W I N. Hit the like button. Keep it here, National Football Show. Underdog Fantasy is the easiest place to play fantasy sports and certainly the easiest when you're watching the NBA and the NBA playoffs are almost here and you can win money making picks. What are you waiting for? Sign up on underdogfantasy.com and use the promo code WIN. An underdog will double your first deposit up to $100. That's underdogfantasy.com. Use the promo code WIN. Get ready for the NBA and get ready for the NBA playoffs. Go to underdogfantasy.com. Use the promo code WIN. Philadelphia fans were cut from a different cloth. Born into a brotherhood and bonded to our team for life. We believe anything is possible because we've witnessed the impossible. While we may be from different neighborhoods, come Sunday, we are one and we will be heard. Pondley Hockey, official partner of the Philadelphia Eagles. Hi everybody, my name is Jason Lombardi. I'm an inspector at DryTech. At DryTech we offer three major services. The first one being basement waterproofing. The second service we offer is foundation and structural repairs. And then the third service that we offer is mold remediation. If you feel you are having a waterproofing issue, give DryTech a call or check us out online. Mike Little was a union construction worker who was badly, badly injured when he suffered a horrific fall because of someone's negligence. His life would change forever. It was just a real downward spiral with everything. Everything you do, and you're sitting home by yourself all day. Have no, you know, you can't go out because you can't drive, you can't walk well. It was just a horrible situation. Call Brian Fritz at the Fritz and Beyond Cooley Law Firm at 215-548-2222. E-A-G-L-E-S Eagles Egg Sales National Football Show We appreciate you coming aboard Herm Edwards will join us at the bottom of the hour We will talk with him And get his national perspective On the Eagles and everyone else In the National Football League Real quick, I told you that you guys were Either going to love John Tortorella, or you weren't going to like John Tortorella. John Tortorella wears you out. And he wears media people out because he hates media people. That's why he always came on my show, because he never looked at me like that. I loved John Tortorella. Benching captains, talking shit, benching Javi Bullen when he was in Tampa, who had won a Stanley Cup for him. He don't care. John don't care. You see, he's your best coach in Philly. That's a coach, Nick. You should take some pointers from a true coach who takes no shit. John Tortorella takes no shit. Your guy, Nick Sirianni, he expresses shit. 
He is the carrier of lies. Tortorello, that's the one thing you're never going to get from him. Okay? You're never going to get that from John. That guy's just not that dude, man. I got to get Torts on again here. I got to get him on. John Tortorella, man, he ain't, he ain't for everybody. You guys probably won't like John Tortorella. You see, people like LJ and some of you other guys, you wouldn't like John because you don't like the way people talk to you. Well, you wouldn't like Tortorella. Okay, you wouldn't like John because that's not what he is. He's not for the faint of heart. Arthur, my God, you would melt in a pan like a piece of butter if Tortorella talked to you. You might leave the interview with Tortorella crying in a bucket of tears. See, you guys see some of these guys from afar. I've seen them dudes up close and personal. Okay? And what he's doing to the Philly media, I'm surprised he hasn't gone knee deeper in him. Okay? He, he hasn't, I'm surprised he hasn't beat everyone up verbally. I loved it the other day. I'm not leaving. <laughs> hey, I text Keith and I said, man, this guy never stops. He's the same guy. You know why he got fired in Vancouver? He got fired because he had taken the team to the Stanley Cup Finals. And the owner came down and started talking to the team and started talking shit. John grabbed him and threw him out of the locker room. And he was fired that week. John goes, no one talks to my team. Okay. Um, no one talks to my team like that. I love him. Absolutely sensational. Herm Edwards will join us at the bottom of the hour. So Derek Barnett just signs a brand new contract extension with the Houston Texans. And you know what D'Amico Ryan said? Man, he's been a pleasant surprise for us. He's been really good for us. We really like the player. And we're going to see if we can make this thing work in even more of a long-term deal for Derek Barnett. <laughs> oh, my God. So, wait a minute. The Texans gave him an extension, and the Eagles cut him. Okay. Hey, once again, wonderful talent evaluators in Philadelphia on defense. Tremendous. <laughs> Who wouldn't want out with that train wreck of a shit show last year on defense? That's why Fletcher Cox retired. You want to be part of that garbage? What do you mean, part of that? Hey, all right. Hey, Derek Barnett. Okay. Derek Barnett just signs a contract extension with the Houston Texans. God forbid. Kyle says that Barnett played like shit in Philadelphia for six years. Okay. How about some better coaching? Wait a minute. Let me take a look at that. How many edge rushers have you developed in Philly in the last six years? That'd be a goose egg. Don't make it sound like you're some sort of well-coached defensive football team. You're not. You're not. What linebacker have you developed in the last seven, eight years? What corner have you developed in the last decade? You haven't. Don't come off like you do great coaching on defense when you haven't developed a single player. You make it sound like you are some sort of like guru of coaches like in Pittsburgh. You know why Pittsburgh wins with shitty players? Because they got phenomenal assistant coaches. That's why they win. Hey, by the way, 
look at C24. Sills, what's our record going to be this year? Um, I would say 6 and 11. Something in there. 7 and 10. Yeah. Something like that. 7 and 10. And look at look at Crowley. Develop TJ Edwards and then you let him go. Once you had to pay him. Congratulations to you. Well done. Thank you, Crowley. You develop a player for another team. Great. Well done. You developed a player for another team. And basically, you found him. You didn't draft him. You found him. He was a UDFA, undrafted free agent. You found him. But because how he didn't draft him, he doesn't get the credit for that or what have you. You developed him for the Bears. I don't know how you guys think you're going to have more wins than seven wins with that defense. You couldn't beat the Giants or the Bucks. What 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 makes you think you're going to have 15 wins when your defense stinks? What what are you talking about? What has changed? Vic Fangio putting the same system in? Guys, what in the world have you done to improve your team? Wait a minute. What in the world have you done to improve your football team? Signing Saquon Barkley doesn't help your team. It helps your offense. It helps your offense. Holy cow. you got to be kidding me. My... Here, it would have been another decent sign. Why didn't you sign Tyron Smith? You see what the Jets signed him for? $12 million in playing incentives, which means if he doesn't play, he doesn't get paid. So say he misses half the season. That's a gamble that I'm willing to take. You know why? Because he's a Hall of Fame player who's still got something in the tank left. That's what I, that's, Devin White is, it's a gamble I have no interest in. Tyron Smith to play right guard for me is a gamble. The Jets are making good moves in the offseason. Joe Douglas is. And what they did, they protected themselves if Tyron Smith can't play. Okay, if he can't play, he doesn't get the 12 million. It's basically all of his money is in incentives of being able to play. That's it. Yeah, look at look at this guy. Tyrod Taylor is finished. Really? Okay. Completely untrue. If that's the case, dude, you're out of your mind. Dude, how about this one? Tyron Smith is is out of gas, but Brandon Graham's not. Is that correct? Okay. Are you really? Is that what you're telling me? Tyron Smith. Tyron Smith is, is, is out of gas, but Brandon Graham isn't. And you brought that guy back. Come on, man. Tyron Smith is going to the Pro Football Hall of Famer. And if he plays for the Jets, that's a gamble you take. You know why? Because that player's good. Devin White's not. Okay? Um, he's not. Jason says, I think you should keep Steen as backup tackle swing and draft a, a right guard. You're going to use the 22nd pick on the draft 
for a right guard. I'm not doing that. I would sit here and I would get I, I, you. You can get a hell of an offensive lineman. Um, in my opinion, it, but but again, what I'm saying, Yale, once again, is Tyron Smith. Tyron Smith is worth the gamble of twelve million dollars. Bryce Huff is a crapshoot. Devin White is a crapshoot. Those are smart moves. That's a smart move. You know why? If the player doesn't play, you cut him, and you don't owe him any money. Okay, if his back hurts, cut him. But here's the problem with the Eagles. They signed a player who's not good enough and doesn't fit a 34. Slagger, he doesn't fit a 34. Nobody thinks he's going to be an asset in a 3-4 defense. Nobody. Nobody. So put it this way, if the Eagles make a signing, it's bad move. But if another team does it, it's a good move. And it's a good gamble. Yeah, because there's no money around it. And he's a superior player. He's a Hall of Fame player. Yeah. Devin White is not a Hall of Fame player. He's not that good. Okay? Rumors of Hassan Reddick to Atlanta for Kyle Pitts not happening. They'll never give up Kyle Pitts. By the way, stop thinking Hassan Reddick has that much value. He does not. Reddick does not have that kind of value that you think he does. He is not getting you a one, two, or three. He is not. Okay? He's absolutely not. Nobody's going to surrender draft picks for Hassan Reddick that are high-quality picks like a first or second rounder. Never. Never, ever would they do that. Ever. And don't you think if a team had floated a first rounder out, the Eagles would have may have signed him, restructured his deal and traded him for the first round pick. Oh, no, wait. Nobody in their planet is giving a one-up They didn't give a one-up for Brian Burns when they traded him. And you think you're getting a one for a player who's one-dimensional. Hassan Reddick is Bryce Huff. And the Jets let him walk out the building too. Why why did the Jets, you think, let that guy walk out the building? Because they didn't think he was an essential part of their defense. How's that? A good sign when the Jets didn't think he was a good player. So you signed a guy, two guys, Huff and White, that both organizations thought weren't good players. Really? Once again, here's another guy. LJ doesn't know what he's talking about. Cowboys were $14 million over the cap. And in the last three years, they've got rid of Amari Cooper and they've gotten and had to dump Zeke Elliott. And now they've had to dump Tyron Smith because they're over the cap because they got to sign CeeDee Lamb and Michael Parsons in the quarterback. Dallas hasn't spent anything right now because you know why? And it just shows you Dallas hasn't really signed anybody. Why? Because they're not, they don't have the money. Dallas doesn't have the money and they don't want to spend the money unless it's on their own people. So at the end of the day, once again, here's a guy not knowing what he's talking about. Cowboys over the cap and their priorities are Lamb, Parsons, and the quarterback. 
They don't even have a number two wide receiver. Yeah, you got $40 million left in cap space. For what? What are you going to do with it? There's nobody on the market right now that's worthy of paying. Okay? They have to cut people and restructure contracts. That's right, Yale. That's what the offseason is about. That's why, Yale, when I say this to people, they don't get it. You build your team. And like what well, Keith said it too the other day, Keith Byer said it. And he said it well. You build your championship team today, now, in this offseason. And you validate it. And you prove it in the fall. That's when you prove it. If you've built a championship team or not. Okay? No, I I, I don't know. I, I don't think the... Gardner Johnson thing is not a bad sign. I I don't think that. I didn't say that. I don't think he's exceptional at run fits and in pass coverage, but he's a playmaking guy. The issue with Philly decisions on defense is that you don't have a football guy like Joe Douglas making the call. Spot on. That's not a guy in the building banging on the table to build a long-term defense. Stoutland will turn Steen into a Pro Bowl right guard. Martin, I can't dispute that. Okay, I can't dispute that. Probably. I mean, here, I'm going to tell you the secret and what I think Jeff Stoutland did last year that was so phenomenal and so exceptional. He took a guard or a center and took him out of position and he made Cam Jurgens into a serviceable right guard above service. A pretty good ball player over there on the right side in his non-natural position. He's turned Landon Dickerson into... He's turned Landon Dickerson into the highest paid guard, and he was brought in also as a center. Okay? How he's in win now mode? No, yeah. How do you say that when he's gone cheap in all of his signs? And Yale says, disagree. Eagles run front office, run circles around the Jets. I can't dispute that. Okay, I think they've done a nice job um, the last couple years. But that Zach Wilson deal, once again, you know, the Jets and the Bears, it just seems that that's the death hole of quarterback, Phil. You know what I mean? You, you're, you get drafted as a quarterback in those two places, you go there to die. For whatever reason, you just go there to die. Okay, her. Herm Edwards is going to join us here at 4.30 Eastern time here in a couple minutes. So we're going to get Coach Edwards on here. Hey, made his bones in Philly, did he not? Right? Made his bones in Philly. Sills, how he has book smarts and not street smarts, football smarts. On paper, it should work. That's analytics you're talking, Bob. When you say to me, on paper, it should work, those are the analytic guys. I think the analytic guys run your draft. It's evident. They run your draft. You could have drafted Kyle Hamilton. Instead, you took Jordan Davis that high, right? Okay. I said it draft day. I didn't think the Jordan Davis draft pick is bad. But he's not the 13th pick. Okay? He's just not. So we're going to get back to that here. Um, Ian Beckles' last hour was awesome. 10-year-plus NFL veteran, Buccaneer. And we're going to get Randy Cross on with us from CBS Sports, winner of three Super Bowls at 530 Eastern, and we will talk to him. 
I'll tell you something. You want to know something about a coaching staff. I'm so happy that Raheem Morris got a job um, in in Atlanta as the head coach. Rich McKay's down there, by the way, guy who drafted me for the Buccaneers, and I love Rich McKay. But can you imagine being on a coaching staff with Herm Edwards, Mike Tomlin, Lovey Smith? Um, I think Monty Kiffin may have been on that staff back in the day. And you had Tony Dungy as the head coach when they were putting that organization together and coach Dungy was pulling the bucks out of the, um, out of the cellar and Herm now back in the media. And I love coach Edwards so much. I thought he got a raw deal at ASU, but we'll talk about that some other time. He's back in the media at ESPN. He joins us now here on the national football show. Hey, you doing coach. I am well, my friend, and um, uh, you're right about Raheem, but let me tell you uh, the story about Raheem Morris. Um, he actually wasn't down there with 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 um, with uh, Lovey or myself. He was down there probably with Mike because Mike took my place. I was with the Jets. So here's the story of Raheem Morris. Um, uh, we're in the off season and we're doing our drills with our players. And all of a sudden this guy comes, he walks over and he says, uh, coach, uh, my name's Raheem Morris. I look at him. I go, yeah. He says, you know, I, I want to know, can I volunteer? And I said, volunteer for what? And he <laughs> says, well, I want, you know, I want to be a football coach. I said, you play football? And he went, yeah, I played here at Hofstra. And I said, really? And he played DB. And I said, okay, you show up tomorrow at seven o'clock. So he shows up. And sure enough, I put him in the back of the room. He starts listening in. He's kind of a helper. And then Monty Kiffin calls, and he's in Tampa. And Monty says, you know, I'm looking for, like, a young GA. So I got the perfect guy, Monty, Raheem Morris. So I send Raheem Morris down to Tampa, and that's kind of how it got started for Raheem. And, and you mentioned earlier you're happy for him, so am I. Hey, I, I, that coaching staff, <laughs> what was that like being on that with Tony and all that? I mean, you know what else, too, Coach? This goes back to Dennis Green, I think. You know, yeah, I mean, yeah. given opportunities to minorities in the way that Coach did, but Coach was looking for the best coach, not just minority coaches. He was looking for the best coaches. But that had to be quite an honor to be on that staff. Well, Tony and myself go way back. The Tony Dungy story is real simple, okay? We, we're playing in this all-star game together. I don't know Tony. We're on this bus, right, and we're driving to practice. And I, he's sitting across from me, and I go, what's your name? He said, Tony Dungy. I said, okay. <clears throat> you know, Herm Edwards. And I look at him. I say, what position do you play? I said, you play safety? And he went, no. And I said, well, you're running back? He said, no. He said, I'm quarterback. And I said, you're what? <laughs> he said, quarterback. I said, for who? <laughs> he said, yeah. I, said I said, man, you got to be kidding me. So he's laughing. I said, no, I play quarterback. I said, really? And, you know, it was like he played quarterback. And sure enough, we played the all-star game. He's a quarterback. So we so then you went to the East West. And from the East West, you went to the you went to Japan. Right? You went to the Hula Bowl in Japan. So we're going to Japan. We're playing in this Japan bowl. And Tony's on the opposite team. And he's driving the ball down there to win the game at the end. The ball gets tipped in the red zone. I intercept it. So he's not the MVP. They don't win. We actually win, win this game, right? And so from that day on. It's been kind of running joke. So when we got together in Tampa, when I went down there with Lovey, Amani, uh, uh, Rod Marinelli, obviously, we were all down there with Tony. We used to have like, we used to divide the team up and have like games. You know, we'd play against each other, right? Tony would have one team, I'd have the other team because I was the assistant head coach and, um, and the secondary guy. And so Lynch and those guys used to tell me, says, man, every time we, you're on our team, he's just coach, when we're in our team, we can't win. And I go, why? Because every time we do something, Tony changes the rule, calls a penalty or something. And I said, yeah, he's still mad at me at the Japan Bowl for intercepting the ball, man. <laughs> Absolutely funny as hell, man. <laughs> I love it. Hey, you'll love this, Herm. We had um, Merrill Reese on oh, Merle, a couple good man. days ago. And we were talking about Dick for meal. Oh, he boy. said every practice that Dick goes to, he goes to a couple practices a year. And he watches these new practices where – he, he leaves shaking his head because they're only on the field for like 38 minutes. And he goes like this and, and Merrill goes like this to him. He goes, what's the matter? Dick? He goes, I, I, I just don't get it. I, I, I mean, that must have, I played for Ray Perkins. 
Oh, Bernie, yeah. Well, that yeah. must have been one of the hardest things you ever did was going through training camp with Coach Vermeil. Well, and you remember back in the day now. Three days. And and six preseason games. Oh, my God. That's right. You got I played only four. You played no. six. Six. So, and they were real games. I mean, Dick thought they were real games. It was like, what? <laughs> we're playing football. <laughs> and I was a rookie. And he looks at me and he tells me after about the third practice. He said, look, he said, don't even think about coming out of preseason. I'm going to get you ready to be the starter. He says, you got to play the whole preseason games. And I'm all excited. Yeah, coach. And the veterans are looking at me going, this rookie's crazy. And sure enough, we played six preseason games. Yeah. Double days, triple days, like you say, we there was no such things without wearing shoulder pads with Dick Vermeer. Absolutely. What was it like playing at the old vet? Oh. What was it like being a player in that time? Because I'll tell you something, Coach. Last three years, these Eagle fans are as passionate because of their civic pride they have for that team. Yes. And I don't think that's changed since the time when you played there. What was that experience like for you? It was unbelievable. And, you know, you grew up on the West Coast and you go to Philly and, you know, you, you're going to play for the Eagles and you go, okay, I, I get it and play for the Eagles. And, you know, they had some veteran guys. Jaws came from the Rams then. We came at the same time. Harold Carmichael was already there. You know, they had a bunch of players. Dick Dick was already there for a year. And then his second year I got there. He's trying to rebuild his program. And uh, the fan base, boy, I tell you what, you're talking about a passionate fan base. You know, and the old vet, like playing on that turf was like playing on the cement. And then the ironic thing, you know, they had a jailhouse in the vet. <laughs> <laughs> 700 <laughs> level, baby. Yeah, you know, and it, was just, it was like, boy, I tell you what, I tell people all the time, the loudest it's ever been in a stadium for me as a player was when we played the Dallas Cowboys in the championship game and we were fortunate enough to win that game and go on to the Super Bowl. It was so loud and passionate. I'll never forget that. Those fans were just going nuts, man. It was like, you know, and once you win the last championship game, you don't realize because you get in the playoffs and you're in the playoff mode. And then we kind of looked at each other on the sideline, the players and said, Man, we're going to the Super Bowl. <laughs> you know, it's like, well, yeah, we're going. <laughs> yeah. But it, that, that great, great fan base. Great fan base. I love it. I love it. Coach, let's get into the Eagles right now. Your take sure. on Jalen Hurts. What what is your look? He kind of had a had a step back year this past season. Yeah. You know, coordinator could have been an issue there. He had 18 turnovers. Coming off the MVP season, the team itself uh, kind of had a step backwards. But your overall impression of Jalen as he moves forward into the 24 season? Oh, I think he's a marvelous player. I think he has great leadership skills. Uh, the team believes in him. Uh, you, you're not going to get a better guy to play quarterback. I, I thought the, the offense was 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 sluggish. You know, when you watched it, I mean, I mean, I mean, when they, you know, going through the season, I remember when they lost. That, a game, I said, guys, they're in trouble. And everybody was saying, what are you talking about? I said, when you watch him play, just look at it. There was no continuity to the offense. When people pressed them and they brought pressure, their out was, I'm going to try to throw a fade down the boundary to Brown. They never seemed to attack the middle of the field. The defense was obviously a little bit different. You know, this they had, they had 43 sacks last year. They had 70 the prior year. Yep. I mean, the secondary, the linebacker, there's no impactful linebacker for them. Right. They were just they weren't the same team. And it's hard to repeat what you did the previous year. It's just because everybody's playing their best against you. you, know, you that's what you got to learn now. You know, when it's like when we went to the Super Bowl, we come back off the next year. We got into the playoffs. and We got eliminated the first round because everybody's playing their best game. But the offense was out of sync and the defense got they, they were dead last now. They were not very good. Coach, how about this? To what you're saying, expand on what you're saying. How about that? I said this about DeAndre Swift. Mm. I didn't really think he was an upgrade on Miles Sanders because I think they lost a little physicality. Now they bring mm. in Saquon Barkley now. Is this maybe what you're talking about where it became more finesse at the end of last year and they want to get back more to being one of those power teams and dominant teams at the point of attack? And look, if you're, if you're an eagle – player the one thing that city expects out of you you got to be tough they want tough football teams they just do that's the philly way they don't know it any better than that 
It's not, it ain't, it's, it's, come on, we're going to hit you right in the face, right? We're on Broad Street, we're going to hit you in the face. That's what they believe in. So I, I think getting Barkley now, oh boy, that's, that's, he's a, it's going to take a lot of pressure off Hurst because they ran him too much and then he got hurt. When his knee was hurt, he never was well. He never was 100%. You could tell the way he ran. He was, he was gingerly at best. But I think uh, uh, Saquon now adding him, and don't lose sight of this about Saquon. You got to throw him the ball. He can really catch. He's a bad matchup for linebackers coming out in the passing game. And this is the guy all of a sudden, he needs to catch 50, 60 balls. Don't just run him. Throw, put him in the passing tree. Let him get the ball in his hand in space. Coach, tell me how you do this, though. You've got A.J. Brown. Mm. You've got Devontae Smith. You've got Dallas Goddard. Now you've got Barkley. And like you said, one of the things, if you look at the throw chart, Jalen threw to the numbers, had an eight quarterback rating across the middle. Now, that could have been because Goddard was injured middle part of the season, so they went away from the middle of the field. How do you, with a new coordinator coming in and Kellen Moore, is it a priority this offseason in OTAs and minicamps that you get everyone on the same page? Keith Byer said this, Coach. Last year, he didn't feel they were playing championship football because they weren't spreading the ball around. No. And if you can't spread the ball around, I don't care how many talented guys you have, how much of a challenge is that for these for the new coordinator and for the new talent on the team? Well, I think for Kellen Moore, he's going to be fine. He, he, he's been places with talent, with running backs that can catch the ball, with tight ends. So this is why you hire a guy like this. He, he'll make sure – that defensively you're a little bit in a pickle because how do you defend the field now? And he's going to, he's going to attack all the grass on the field, by the way. He, he's not just going to throw it outside the number. He's going to attack the middle of the field. He's going to attack you right in the middle so that he can get the matchups he's wants outside with the big physical receiver in Brown. Right? So Goddard and, 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 and Saquon obviously will attack the middle uh, along with some other things that he's going to do. So, He's going to set it up. I mean, if you're if, if, if you're Hurst, you got to be excited about this guy. Being a, a former quarterback, he gets it. Uh, he's going to have an answer. Obviously, when they bring pressure, he's going to he ain't going to hold it in his hand a whole lot. He's going to get it out of his hand and get it to him and, and let him run and, and make plays in space. So I think this is a good get for them. Uh, it's going to be fun to watch. Now, here's the deal, you know. The guy that hikes the ball, all of a sudden, yeah, he gone. That'll be interesting. Does the Philly push, push, stay alive? Without, without Jason him Kelsey. Being, yep, without him being the center. Because he's unique. He's a long-arm guy. And people don't realize that length of where he put that ball, Yep, that helps that Philly push now. Right? I hadn't thought of that, Coach. That's yeah. exactly right, because he's that length. That Plus length, lo how low he got, that helps. It'll be. I think they can still do it, but he was a master at it. Now they were really good at it. You know, they were always in. Think about this: it's first and eight. It's not first and ten. No, right. It's first and eight. Right. If you're an offensive coordinator, you're going. To, it's first and eight. I don't have to worry about ten. I two yards. I got it. I got the two yards. I can go. I can make two yards anytime. You know, 95% of the time I can make it. I'm good. So I'm dialing up first and eight, not first and ten. Coach, do you think they're making a mistake by taking the legs away from Hertz where his dual threat is the reason he got paid? Coach Vermeil thinks this. Hey, man, you should run that guy and run that guy like, you know, I'm going to run him because that's what that guy does. On third and 11, coach, at 22, I thought that guy was a weapon. And as you would know, as a de defensive-minded guy, that breaks a defense's back when you got a quarterback that does that. Last year, the INTs and the turnovers went up to 18. Yeah. yeah. Okay? Do you still want to keep the RPO in because they seemingly are getting away from it? Uh, I would – you, you got to have it in your arsenal because – Look, when you have a quarterback with his skill, I think they got nervous when he got hurt. Okay. Right? I do too. He got that, and, and we all did, because you saw it. He, he never, he wasn't 100% anymore. You could tell the way he ran, he ran gingerly. Now he's back this year. So I do believe this. 
with him and any quarterback that has the ability to run, you balance the playing field. It's 11 on 11. The defense doesn't have an extra guy anymore. It's only 10 on 11 because the quarterback doesn't run. You never worry about the quarterback. But you get a quarterback of his caliber, it's 11 on 11 football. When you're rushing him, who's containing him? Who's going to kick out the quarterback? Is it one of the rushers? Is it the linebacker? Is it a safety? Somebody's got to add on to this, right? Because you, when he escapes, you've got to have somebody that has the quarterback. So they got to run him. I think they will. They'll use him in a run game some. A couple last questions for you, Coach. Um, they, they acquire a guy in Devin White, and this is what I heard. We had Ian Beckles on last hour, covers the team, and a Sap had a conversation about him and said this about him. Here was the fifth pick in the draft. Last five years, he hasn't been um, mentally focused all the time. He, he's been up and down in his career. It's, he's one of these guys, Coach, when things are going great, he's a spectacular talent and athlete on the field. Oh. But when things go south, he has a propensity, and they benched him at the end of the year last year. How do you coach someone like that? Well, I think what you do, it, look, I, I, it, this, this and Vic Fangio is the new DC. Yeah, Vic, Vic will have he'll have a conversation, with, and, and maybe you start him out because first of all, you want guys like this to have success. So how do you do that? You don't put a lot on his plate right away because first of all, look, he's a little bit in shock because he because he's been he's out. The, the previous team they got rid of him, and now he's saying I get a new start. And that's the conversation you're going to have with him when you bring him in. So, look, you get a new start. Whatever happened there, doesn't matter. You're on this team now. We're a playoff caliber football team. We need you to be an impact player. And the way I look at it, I'm going to start you off and put you in position to make plays. So, with that being said, maybe you put him in packages. Mm. You, don't, you don't give him a whole lot. Let him have some early success. Build on his six. Don't build on his past. Build on something that's going forward. And as he grows and gets better, you give him a little more. But you don't put it all on his plate right away. Right? And, and I think if you do that, you give him some time. Because players know this. Players so put him in a position to succeed. There you go. Players don't want to be exposed. That's the worst thing you can do for a football player. Expose yep. him. Have him do things when he's not comfortable doing. He's going, man, coaches, man, coach, man, coaches put me in a bad deal. No, here's what you do. This is all you need to do. And let him do that, get some confidence, get in the groove with the guys, and all of a sudden, maybe he can find his way. Couple last questions here, coach. I got to get to Jaden Daniels because oh if there's anybody <laughs> that could give you the insight because now again, you had him at Arizona State. He transfers yes. to LSU. I'm wondering how that situation came about because Jalen Hurts went through it at Alabama. Um, you coached the player. Do you see success with this player at the next level? And yes. do you think there's any kind of issues? Did you have an issue with him when he was at Arizona State? Not one. The guy's like my son. Okay. Talk to him before every game when he was at LSU. When he, walked, oh, when, he, when he walked in my office and he decided to go, and we know why he went. We won't even get into that. Yep. I hugged him and I said, you go. And nothing's changed. I've talked to him all the time, visit with him. I mean, watching him grow as a football player, I mean, you know, he needed time. I saw him as, I saw him as rookie. I mean, we always went to the playoffs with the guy. He, he is a spectacular player. In big moments, he understands it. He, he doesn't freeze up. Can throw the ball down the field as accurate as anybody. A better runner than you think. I'm going to mention this name. People say, well, who is this guy? I said, it's real simple. He's Randall Cunningham. Wow. Think about it. Think about it. Yeah, same no, features, I see same it. Features. I played with Randall there. He's Randall Cunningham. He's the second version to come with Randall Cunningham. That's what he is. I mean, he's unbelievable. I mean, he's just, you know, it, it, I mean, great kid. My, my two daughters are like his sisters. 
So, I mean, you know, I mean, come on, man. Wait, coach. That That's why you play for a guy like you. Because you're honest. You know, when you leave, I left Maryland to go play for Jimmy Johnson. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, but very seldom do you have a guy go, I get it. I understand it. And I love you. And yeah. then get this. My coaches are still my friends 30 years later. And Jimmy comes on my show. All those guys, Dave wants that. Butch Dave are my friends to this day. Yeah. You know, that year after COVID, we played, you know, we played two games and we played the next season. Look, let me tell you something. I lost seven guys. I know you did. Good players. I mean, Johnny Wilson in Florida State. Right. Uh, Ricky Pearsall. I mean, I was, I was a bunch of them. I wasn't mad at them. I said, man, I get it. I, I know why you're going. It ain't got nothing to do with me. I, right. I understand it, man. I, I think, and, and you look at it, and that's the hard thing about college football anymore. That it's not, the NFL's easier. Because when they sign a contract, they can't leave. In college football, you got to recruit your guys not every year. You got to recruit them every week. That's why Nick Saban, he can still coach. He didn't want to do that anymore. He said, God, I, I don't want to do this. I got to recruit my I'm at, every Every day I got a guy that's, you know, thinking about leaving. One of my better players. Right? I mean, it's just, it's hard, but that's the landscape right now. And some guys don't, it's just, it's just hard. Coach, last question for you. And I want to take it here because a guy just dropped five bucks on the question. He wants to know because the Eagles are going to a Vic Fangio 34, having played a fourth 43 last year or a five front. What's the nuance, small nuance in layman terms here that you think that you have that change? Is it a drastic change? Is it a change that is going to be seamless or does it take time in a system like that? It'll take, we, we had, a, we were a three four team. Now on third down, we were four man front. We rushed them, but it, it gives you the ability to now here's the deal though. When you decide to do that, um, you have to get some linebackers. Now, the great part about the NFL anymore, you play with five DBs. So oh. that guy in the box, for, for us in Tampa, that guy in the box was John Lynch. So for you, Coach, it's more important to have a back four than it is really to have the superstar linebackers. Yeah. You, because you can gonna, get away with not marginal, but good players at the LB position. Yeah. But you've got to have strong and free in corners. Think about this. When we were in Tampa and we went nickel, here's our nickel package. Lynch is in the box along with Rondi Barber being a nickel back. Both Holy of them Hall God. of Famers. Both of them Hall of Famers. And then you got Sapp at the three technique and got Derek Brooks at the weak linebacker position. Four Hall of Famers. And Hall of Fame coaches on that stuff. Yeah, Tony Daniel, Hall of Fame coach. <laughs> Mike Tomlin, obviously, soon to be a Hall of Fame coach. I mean, come on, man. <laughs> hey, Coach, can I sneak one more in? Sure. Justin Fields. Oh, boy. Do you think he's gone to a situation in Pittsburgh where they believe in player development more and they know what they're doing at that position? Yeah, and, and think about it. When, when the Pittsburgh Steelers are good on offense – Think about the two quarterbacks they've had over the years. Yeah. Right? It's really been the two. Right, Roethlisberger and Bradshaw. Defensively, they always, they're always in the mix. Russell Wilson just added something to his career if he's the starter. Why? It's the Seattle Seahawks offense. They're going to run the ball, manage the game. The Legion of Boom defense that he played for in Seattle, he knows if I don't turn the ball over, um, I'm going to be okay. Right? So the, the defense and special teams will set the stage. Justin Fields is sitting in that rocking chair going, okay, I get to compete against this guy. And Mike Tomlin is going to play the best guy. He doesn't care who you name. He don't care if you're Russell Wilson and you got all these accolades. You better show him now. He's going to tell those guys, look, there's, there's no way Justin Fields goes there if he doesn't think I get to compete for this. I love it. Coach, I feel like JV with my – Small game balls behind your game balls. <laughs> no, I, I, I look, hey, hey, folks, I look like I'm on the JV team. No, no, with no. All my game balls there. Okay. And I look at Coach Edwards and I'm going like, damn. 
Sorry, well, Coach, hey, I got distracted. That's 30 years, baby. That's coaching <laughs> and playing. That's 30 years, man. That's a lot of footballs, man. Uh, coach, I love you so much for taking time, as you always do. Thank you so much. Anytime, my friend. It's always good to visit with you. You got a great show, man. Appreciate you for letting me uh, be an op- have an opportunity to be on with you. Thank you so much, Coach. I appreciate it. All right. God bless now. Thank you. You got it. The great Herm Edwards. God, I love talking to Coach Edwards. Yeah, I felt a little kind of like the JV. I mean, he had all the game balls back there, and I'm going like this. Jesus. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I got eight. He had like 88. (laughs) Yeah. Hey, man, he said some pretty interesting things that makes me think here. Hey, Yale, did you hear what he said, folks? It's not that important to have superstar linebackers. It's more important about the back end of your defense in a 34. He says you have to have great secondary play. Um... Hey, and there's a guy that was part of one of the greatest defenses of all time when you had Sapp and Barber and Lynch, Brooks, Chidi Ahanatu, Simeon Rice. See, Flexen, uh, that's my point. Right there, Flexen. See, Flexen, TJ Edwards was a solid player. And you don't have a solid player. You're right. You don't have a solid player right now. That's right. You don't have a solid player. Oh, my God, Yell. I should have asked him to show me the ball from the Meadowlands. Okay? I Hey, I, I'd like to have seen that game ball. The actual football... I wonder if he has that. I'm going to text him. Okay? I'm going to text him. Um, if, if if he has the actual Joe Pisarchik game ball when he took that ball into the end zone. God, I'd love that, man. I'd love to see that. Again, would that not be one of the – hey, would that not be one of the greatest pieces of Philadelphia sports memorabilia of all time if he has the original football that he went in on the Pasarchik, wasn't it Pasarchik and Zonka? Wasn't it Pasarchik and, and Zonka that did that fumble? And some guy named Kotar or something like that? It was Zonka and Pasarchik. The ball pops up. He gets it, Edwards, and he takes it back. That's right. How did Zonka get on that team? I think my own, you want to hear something crazy? Hey, um, Barb, you ready for this? I think my uncle was the general manager of the Giants for that team. (laughs) So some of you are probably going to go, hey, it's in the blood. Sills don't know how to build a team. (laughs) I think, I, I think my uncle was the general manager of that team. Robustelli and I, I, I want to say John McVay was the head coach or some shit like that. Holy cow! Eagles don't draft linebackers in the first round. No, nope, they don't. And they traditionally, since the Howie Roseman era, don't draft well at all at the position. But I thought Herm brought some great things up here, man. You know, and that, you hear what he said about you. Hey, how it is McVay's grandfather. How about what he said, how he would play Devin White? How, did you hear what he said? Don't start him. Gradually put him in. Put him in a position of success. Okay? Put him in a put him in a position of success. Prince says something. That's why I keep saying, let's see how it plays out. Hey, Prince, that's kind of what Coach Edwards said, didn't he? He goes like this. Well, well, in a way, though, he's like, 
they well they they have addressed to Prince's point. They have addressed the safety position with a good player. With Gardner Johnson. They have addressed that. Okay? Seals, the focus at the draft must be the back seven. Box safeties and physical corners. Are you comfortable with Milton Williams being your right defensive end, though? Chris is right. The Eagle defense in a... Th- well, that's right. No, you're right, Chris. 34 is not Tampa 2. Tampa 2 is a forefront. You don't have a nose guard. You have a forefront in a in a Tampa 2. You're right. This is more 34. You got to have linebackers, he said. That's right. Okay, and most of... But he said, too, most of the time, you're going to be a nickel. Okay, you're, you're going to be a nickel most of the time. So, but I agree with you, Chris. Tampa, too, you have to have exceptional linebackers. They had exceptional linebackers in Tampa. I covered that team. They were just exceptional. Brooks was as good as it got. It hit the hole, and he was a small dude. You know what? To some of you guys, when you guys say Jeremiah Trotter Jr., Jeremiah Trotter Jr. kind of looks like uh, – Derek Brooks a little bit in college. That's what Derek Brooks looked like. Six one and a half, two hundred fifteen pounds. He got to Tampa. He was like barely six two. He was two fifteen, two twenty. Okay. Sills, look at the Ravens. It's DBs too. Prince. I'm gonna tell you, man. Coach, I I value Coach Edwards's opinion. A lot. I do. I I mean, he can change my opinion. Okay. Because I value how he has coached on some really good football teams and been on some really good coaching staffs. He worked with Mike Tomlin and Tony Dungy in Tampa with Monty Kiffin and them guys and Lovey Smith. Lovey Smith, Monty Kiffin. Get this. That's the defensive coaching staff. That's what I'm talking about in player development. You ready? Lovey Smith. Mike Tomlin, Herm Edwards, Monty Kiffin, Tony Dungy was also a defensive-minded guy. You had those five guys working on a defense that became the Tampa 2 and created the Tampa 2 like you saw Jim Johnson doing with numerous defenses in boutiquing a defense. That's what you're talking. Those are great defensive-minded guys. Okay? I'm starting white. Okay. Although the dude from Notre Dame got beat in his last game. Uh, Let's see here. Anybody that covers this team needs coaching at this point. The Eagles are blinding us. Well, I think they got – hey, Clint Hurt is a great coach. And I know I'm probably biased because he's a Miami Hurricane. Brian says, damn, would the uh, Cameron Kitchens fit? He would, and he'd be perfect in your – you know what? I I would not have a problem with the Eagles drafting him in the second round. I think, he, I think he'd be a factor for you in the second round. I do. Hey, folks, real quick. Our great friends at Underdog Fantasy would like you guys to join us here if you can, please. During March Madness, and it's here. It's one of the greatest events in American sports. It's actually the second most bet on event in American sports. How many parlays and how many like betting slips are you involved in right now? Well, we got one for you that doubles it. Justin Simmons and Cooper Dijon like it. Very good, Prince. And Jacob Sports is looking for a select 500 folks from our loyal viewers and subscribers to join us and partner up with us during the tournament. Now, listen, you put 10 bucks up, they match it. You put 20 up, they match 20. Go all the way up to 100 bucks. Simple. 100 bucks, they give you 100 bucks. You got 200 bucks to bet on the tournament to try to improve your investment. It's really, it's more than gambling. It's like being a stockbroker here. Okay. 
The code word, you have to use the code word WIN. W-I-N, that's W-I-N, and that is good luck to you. W-I-N. What are the most successful 34 defenses in history? Steelers. The Ravens. Those kind of defenses. All right. Randy Cross from CBS Sports is going to join us at 5.30 Eastern time. Hit the like button. Keep it here, National Football Show. Underdog Fantasy is the easiest place to play fantasy sports and certainly the easiest when you're watching the NBA and the NBA playoffs are almost here and you can win money making picks. What are you waiting for? Sign up on underdogfantasy.com and use the promo code WIN. An underdog will double your first deposit up to $100. That's underdogfantasy.com. Use the promo code WIN. Get ready for the NBA and get ready for the NBA playoffs. Go to underdogfantasy.com. Use the promo code WIN. Philadelphia fans were cut from a different cloth. Born into a brotherhood and bonded to our team for life. We believe anything is possible because we've witnessed the impossible. While we may be from different neighborhoods, come Sunday, we are one and we will be heard. Pondley Hockey, official partner of the Philadelphia Eagles. Hi everybody, my name is Jason Lombardi. I'm an inspector at DryTech. At DryTech we offer three major services. The first one being basement waterproofing. The second service we offer is foundation and structural repairs. And then the third service that we offer is mold remediation. If you feel you are having a waterproofing issue, give DryTech a call or check us out online. Mike Little was a union construction worker who was badly, badly injured when he suffered a horrific fall because of someone's negligence. His life would change forever. It was just a real downward spiral with everything. Everything you do, and you're sitting home by yourself all day. Have no, you know, you can't go out because you can't drive, you can't walk well. It was just a horrible situation. Call Brian Fritz at the Fritz & Bianculli Law Firm at 215-548-2222. E-A-G-L-E-S, Eagles. Greg Sills, National Football Show. We appreciate you coming aboard. Randy Cross will join us from CBS Sports at 5.30 Eastern time. So we look forward to that. All right. Um, I loved what Coach Edwards said. Man, I'll tell you what. He got a raw deal at Arizona State. Hear what he said about Jaden Daniels. So Jaden Daniels walks into his office and says, Coach, I'm going to transfer to LSU. And Coach says, I understand why. Most coaches would try stopping you no matter what it is because it's all about self-interest. You hear Nick Saban moaning and bitching and crying about nil. But – Coach Edwards said, no, if that's in the best interest for you, go. I love coaches that are honest. Really do. I See, when, when you listen to a guy like that and you see a guy like that and you know, get this, he takes the player and the player development is more important than the success of the team to him because he takes each and every single individual guy and he coaches them individually and takes a separate interest in their lives. That's something Joe Madden told me years ago 
when I was covering the Rays, how do you get everybody to play on the same page? Well, you have to have personal relationships, which each and every single guy in the locker room, because if you don't, they're going to know it right away that you're lying. You're good. They're going to know it. It's so hard. You know what? And I say this, I say this too. You know what? It's got to be hard for a coach like Nick Sirianni or coaches in today's game. Cause you know why you have so much turnover. How do you get a personal relationship with guys that are not going to be on your football team? I mean, do you really think that the Eagles have a personal relationship with Hassan Reddick? How could you have a personal relationship with somebody in two years? I find that to be impossible because most of the time you're negotiating contracts. Yeah, that's how I get it too. I'm awake, are you? It's kind of like a father figure deal, but I also have <clears throat> happen to think it's an old school way of coaching that I think is needed in today's game. I'll tell you this. I loved what he said about having to play. Chris completely doesn't agree with it. But I happen to love what he said about, you know, kind of breadcrumb feeding Devin White. Put him in a – he hasn't had success in the last couple of years. Put him in a position to have success. Right? Prince says, we have the, co we have the coaches this season. We should, have we should have had them last season. Prince, you know, Prince, I'll tell you something here. I think you and I sometimes argue kind of about the same thing. It's just a different way of looking at it. You're right. That was my complaint last year. If you remember right, I said, why would you hire coaches with no experience at all? That was, hey, Yale, if you remember right, that was my biggest complaint. And everyone assumed it was going to be a, it was going to be a seamless transition into these coaches that had no experience. And it was a colossal letdown for many of the players. The defense didn't mature. Jalen Hurts didn't mature. The entire franchise got exposed, including the head coach. Okay? Why did they – why would you do this? Princeton, answer me this. Prince. Answer me this. Why would they do something like that last year, mentally and fundamentally? Okay? And then do something completely different this year. Now, look, I'm not going to rip that because I think it's acknowledging they were wrong. I, you, you know what? They don't have to tell me they were wrong. They're showing me they were wrong. You know, the whole thing about, you know, somebody saying about um, how, how I pointed out how they're treating Hassan Reddick. They really don't have to tell you they want the player out. They're showing you they want the player out. The Eagles have a way of showing you the truth because their actions speak to the truth. I don't think they tell you the truth. As an organization, I don't think the Eagles tell you the truth. I think they show you the truth. Does that make sense? Bob Brown says, Sills, why can't Howie bring a guy like Kerm as a consultant leading up to the draft and help him shape a strategy? He has game testing knowledge and he's a non-threatening demeanor. Could Her Her Herb's a great defensive. I would do Lovey. So, Bob, I think you're saying somebody like that, right? L like Lovey. Look at who Lovey puts in. Look at the guys who Lovey uh, developed. You got two players. There's two guys that went into the NFL draft last year that were Lovey Smith players. And there's a guy that's going to be drafted in the first round that was a Lovey Smith player as a defensive lineman or tight end, I think. And Lovey, Lovey recruited him. You had Devin Witherspoon, and you guys have Sidney Brown. Those are Lovey Smith guys. Those are Lovey Smith. Lovey knows talent and defense. 
Remember, he's the coach that brought that Bears team to the Super Bowl. And but here's the thing with here's the thing with Lovey. He's a no shit guy, man. And I don't think these new analytic front offices like that old style of thinking. I just don't think they I don't think they appreciate that old school thinking. See, Nick Casario in Houston is a guy, in my opinion, who 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 kind of he combines the old school with the new school. Don't forget Randy Cross from CBS Sports, the owner of three Super Bowls, played for Coach Vermeil at UCLA, actually, will be with us and we'll get his thoughts on some of the moves that have gone on. And I'm going to ask him about that comment that I made a couple of days ago about Brock Purdy and Jalen Hurts. I think they're the same guy. Just different ways of getting there. They're the same in the same situation. I would say Purdy's in a better situation because he's got a play calling head coach and he's got a better defense than what Jalen does. So Purdy's in a better position than what Jalen Hurts is in right now going into 24. A collapse like that comes from poor coaching. They failed to adjust to blitzes plus more. It was terrible to watch. Prince, what what but my problem was, okay, you're right. But remember something. Kyle Shanahan had injuries and also they had a losing streak. The Buffalo Bills got out to a rocky start and they made a change even at coordinator from Ken Dorsey to Joe Barry. And they were able to right the ship because of the head coach. So again, I think you and I are talking about the same thing here where you had prime examples of a coach and a head coach that was a problem solver in both Buffalo and in San Francisco. Now, remember this too. You also have a general manager in San Francisco. That's a Hall of Fame football player, John Lynch. And to Barb's point, you have a guy making $50 million a year and he's a $255 million quarterback. Don't you think that guy should have some answers also? So Prince goes, yes, that's our problem. See, he and I are basically, we say the same shit here. I think we just like to argue with one another, but we do. And and and, and Prince, okay, well, how's that dynamic? You know, I started the show off here by going, it's a gamble. What's a bigger gamble? Devin White? Bryce Huff or bringing Sirianni back? Bringing Sirianni back. What's a bigger prop? What's a bigger gamble? Right? Believe me, Prince isn't wrong here. Coaches had no answers. How he had no answers. Nobody could figure out how to stop the bleeding. They couldn't put a tourniquet on the team. Where those other coaches put a tourniquet on it and stopped it. Right? Jalen is the son of a coach and will go with whatever they say. I know. Mm. And get this. I don't want him to be Donovan McNabb, an asshole. But I do want him to go, really? Brian goes, we were panicking. Brian, that's been my contention the whole time. You have to be a mature guy at that head coaching position. In my opinion, and Sirianni's not, Mature enough. You know what? I'll tell you this. I'm going to do something here that I traditionally don't do. You think last year helped Sirianni become a better coach? I'm asking a question I hate asking. 
Can you lose, learn from failure? Yes, you can. Mike Shanahan did. He learned from failure. Okay, can he can he be a better coach because of what happened last year? But I don't know if the Eagles have given him the ability to dig himself out of this. Barb's like he can't be helped. I'm I'm happy it happened, though. There's more pressure on Nick and Howie. Okay, yes. Okay. White's mama coming after you? For what? Telling you what the player's done the last five years? Sure. Okay. I'm not saying anything anybody else isn't saying about the guy. Okay. See, I, I'm I'm with you on this one here. I don't know if they can do anything to help Nick because everything is, he has no control of his future with this team. He has no control of it. He has no control of it right now. Okay. He, he, he doesn't. And one more time here, here's my, here, the only other issue I have so far is the way that you're looking at what they're doing here with Hurts when it comes to taking away his legs. One thing Herm Edwards said, you got to have the RPO in for him. You got to have the RPO. And the Eagles don't want the RPO in him. That's why they bring in Barkley. They're bringing Barkley in because they want to get further away from that. I think this is a mistake. The more you get away from Jalen Hurts running the football, the more you get away from that guy getting you back to a Super Bowl. I think you run yourself away from the Super Bowl the more you do this. This is just my opinion on this here. Okay? The further you get into having him try to win games from the pocket, this is why he was benched at Alabama. It's because he couldn't. I mean, he is not a pocket passer. He's not horrible. But Kirk Cousins is not horrible. So what is he, a Kirk Cousins guy? He doesn't even put the numbers up Kirk Cousins puts up. Jalen Hurts is not a Super Bowl quarterback with this style of play. Jalen Hurts is a Super Bowl quarterback with the 2022 style. There's two different dudes here. There's two different guys we're talking about here. Two completely different guys. That's why Xander goes, well, you know, he still he was good. Yeah. Well, they don't want that guy anymore. Why? This goes back to what Prince said. So last year they made the fundamental decision to put in coaches that were inexperienced. The last two years now, they're bringing in coaches to take Jalen further away from being injured in the thing that he does the best. He's the he, – I'll, I'll say this to you. Jalen Hurts is one of the best running quarterbacks I've ever seen, and I think he's better than Lamar. But when you ask him to do and sit in the pocket, he's not better than Lamar. And when Lamar has to throw the ball from the pocket, he's Jalen Hurts. Turnovers, incompletions, and not capable of winning a big game from the pocket. That's what happened in the AFC Championship game. I mean, that's exactly what happened. You turned him into Jalen Hurts in the AFC title game. Yale, Hurts is a stronger runner passer. He's not a stronger passer runner. You know what I mean? 
The fear factor is that guy in open space. Dude, one of the things that I thought made Aaron Rodgers so special when he got out in the perimeter, he ran a lot when he was younger. Wasn't a ton of yards, but he got first downs with his legs if he needed to. Aaron Rodgers in open space, creating those passing lanes, was frightening. And he was accurate. By the way, he's a superior quarterback than Favre. But Favre will be more revered because of the way he played. Okay, once again, you know, I'm, I'm not going to debate Hertz is not a good passing quarterback from the pocket. He was third worst in blitzes. He can't handle the blitzes. He's predictable in passing, and he throws to the numbers. That's who he is. That's who he is. They've got to somehow get that RPO, like Herm said, back in the game. Okay? And you always remember, the most important number, one in seven. And 20 turnovers almost for Jalen from the pocket. Doubled his interceptions and horrific ending to the season and outplayed by Baker Mayfield. Hey, you might as well say this. Baker Mayfield made $100 million off of kicking the shit out of the Eagles. Okay. The eye test from last year says C+. Plus. C+, plus ain't winning Super Bowls, dude. Right, Yale? That's not winning Super Bowls. That's not even getting back to the a NFC Championship game. C+, plus, that ain't good enough. You're right. Every run doesn't have to be a home run. Correct. They're looking for big play offenses. That's what they're doing. Okay, he was 10 and one from the pocket. He was one and seven from the pocket. You were one and seven. You weren't 10 and one. Why are you looking at half the story? When you get beat by the Giants and Cardinals. Far worse pick. Hey, the NFC title game, probably with the Vikings you're talking. Maybe that one. Hurts needs to stop throwing to guys outside the hashes. Correct. Throws too much to the numbers, and it's predictable. He needs to throw more in the middle of the field. Had an eight quarterback rating there, by the way. And Goddard needs to be more involved. Well, Philly boy, he actually has to be on the field and healthy. And, and, and by the way, okay, Hertz gets beat by dudes, but like Zach Wilson and Tyrod Taylor and all them dudes. Even Kyler Murray looked better than him on the field last year. He had nobody on that team. Who, James Conner? The guy from Terminator? He had nobody on that Cardinal team. And they beat him. Man. It was terrible. Nick Sirianni should have been fired on the spot last year when he went on WIP and proclaimed that if he knew how to fix the thing with the team, he would have done it by now. Had no answers. Absolutely. Had no answers. None. Uh, you know, always remember this, too. You see, when you're talking about a guy like Hertz or Allen or any of these other guys, got to win games that matter. Not just games that put you in a position. Seals, he also beat, beat the good quarterbacks, too. He did. He did. Okay, they were better. But then once they figured it out, he was lost. Baker Mayfield completely outplayed him last year. 
Look at the numbers. And then blew you out in the playoff game. I'm not saying he's better. How about this? Let's put this more appropriate. A bad quarterback outplayed your guy last year. Is that fair? Yeah, would that be fair? A bad quarterback in Baker Mayfield outplayed Hurts last year. Is that fair? Randy Cross is going to join us in a couple minutes. Most running quarterbacks model their game after Vic. What did Vic win? What did what did Vic win? And 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 by the way, Jalen Hurts was on a football team. LJ said that the team had given up. So did he give up too? Wow. $50 million quarterback quit on you too. So the team quit. He's part of the team. It's not just him. So he quit too? Thanks, Yale. Wow, I didn't think about that until now. Thanks for the content, dude. So he quit? Huh. Jalen Hurts quit on his team. Interesting. Okay. I wouldn't have said that. But so that's an indictment. Whew. I'll tell you what, man. This has been a all-out player day. Ian Beckles earlier, 10-year NFL vet. Herm Edwards, second hour. And I got to tell you, man, my man Randy Cross is looking more and more like Moses every day. <laughs> and I'm very proud to bring him in. <laughs> I like about Randy because Randy gives us his, his profit and he's a prophet and tells us a little bit about the NFL. How you doing, <laughs> Moses Cross? I'm doing good. I'm doing good, Dan. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Hey, man, you know, it's funny. I'm going to ask you a question out of the gate here. If you had to build a football team around Brock Purdy or Jalen Hurts, who would you build your football team around? Um, well, I, I be honest with you, I, I think I'd probably go about it very similar ways to what the Eagles and the Niners have done. They've, they've started things out in front of them. That offensive line is solid as hell. They got one of the best blocking and receiving tight ends going in the game and they've sprinkled in all the talent guys around them. Um, if there's one guy that makes that whole thing go besides Brock Purdy, it'd probably be McCaffrey in the way that he can run at running back. He's, I think what he, he can do is highly unusual. You know, he's, there's people paying some running backs a lot of money that can't do the things that McCaffrey can do. Do you think Barkley brings that same dynamic now to the Eagle offense? And I'm not saying he's Christian McCaffrey. Mm -hmm. with the ability he has, but he has a similar skill set, Randy, that he catches the ball. Now, yeah. the last four years, because of the knee injury, hasn't been quite as productive. Two years ago, he had 1,300 yards. So you look back this past season, I don't know what it was, contract, team bad, not a lot of talent around him, but could he bring that same dynamic to that Eagle offense? Hey, he's not quite as sudden. He's not quite you know as elusive you know, in spots and kind of hard to get a solid hit on as McCaffrey is. Um, but, you know, I put him right there with the best in the league, and he's got a group in front of him. That's a bad – even with Jason Kelsey retiring, that's a badass group at offensive line. And he will immediately – he'll get in training camp, and he'll be, he'll be giggling like a 10-year-old schoolgirl in training camp getting a run behind those guys because he's going to notice a distinct difference that the game is a lot easier when you've got the big boys in front of you. Sorry, Randy. Kelsey's not retired. He thinks he is. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> hey, he, hey, he thinks he is, but now that they yeah. got Barkley in there, I don't, yeah, hey, man, I'm going to tell you this. I say week eight, if there's a, there's a nick or two to Cam Jurgens, I don't know, man. How do you, if you're Howie Rose, but not pick the phone up and go, hey, man, I'll tell you what we'll do. They offered him $14 million to come back, and he passed on it. Yeah. I mean, 
Randy, did you struggle with that a little bit? Because you you quit after the Super Bowl, if I'm not right. mistaken, in Miami. Right. When you knew you had that team coming back the following year, and I know Bill bailed, but you did you think about it coming back the next year, or were you finished? Um, yeah, I think a lot of me was done. $14 million might have gotten me to come back. From that. <laughs> that would have, I'd have come back for the 14th year for that. Um <laughs> Yeah, no, and my contract was up. You know, I was like, I was the third or fourth highest paid lineman in the league, and I just, I said, nah. You know, I'll get, I'm going to move on in my life and go into TV and do some other stuff and get a chance to see my kids and all that. But, um, yeah, I can see where it would be difficult, and I wouldn't blame them for for one second, especially if you had if you happen to tune into the the Kelsey Brothers podcast and you notice that he's keeping the heft. If he, if he doesn't just do a crash diet, like a lot of guys do when they get out and he keeps the, uh, he keeps the spirit moving. Yeah. Especially you can tell he's lifting and he's working out and all that. That's when you know, you aren't fully retired. Only offensive guys, only offensive linemen could spot that because Joe Thomas said the same thing to me last night. He goes, Sills, right away, I lost 75 pounds. Yeah. Kelsey's still looking like he's eating the Hershey bars, and he's still looking like he's having – that don't look like a half a sandwich guy right now. He's still putting down them wedges, and I'm like, so what are you saying? He goes, I don't think he's kind of – I don't think he's put the thing down right away. No, Joe, it's a great observation by Joe because Joe's one of those guys that just – he disappeared. He I mean, did. He just – he just disappeared. And, and, you know, Jason's still got the ax handle ass working. So, so he's, as long as he's got that, he's, he, he's still going to be a threat because he can move. Sorry, dude. I'm going to have to give him um, kudos over you at center because I saw something that he did that I don't believe that you could ever do. Hold the beer, jump out of a, a suite with zero spillage, with no shirt on, gun it, and then leap back in to the suite in Buffalo. You have to admit, for a center like that at yeah. his 12, 13 years, that had to be one of the most impressive things you've seen. Yeah, when, I've had, when I had my squad in that 800 or so pound range, <laughs> I, had, I had a little spring, <laughs> at least a little bolt in my legs. But that was when he jumped out, I'm sitting there going, boy, that guy, is, he is, he's jumping into the Buffalo crowd to drink. I'm going, well, it's, at least he's got company in that crowd. Um, <laughs> but then when he just kind of put his hands on the rail and jumped back in, I went, ooh, that's impressive. <laughs> that's pretty good. Hey, Randy, you know, I, I'm glad I went there a little bit here now with you because as a center, you know, I think you're the most underrated center during your era in the history of the league, and I'll tell you why. Everybody else is getting Hall of Fame consideration. I think Harris Barton gets a little conversation, but you get none. And somebody blocked for Joe and Roger Craig and Jerry Rice and Steve. Somebody blocked for those guys. And you were a focal point on those Super Bowl teams, and especially the first Super Bowl when you had none of those guys. Yeah. On no, that the, first, so, the, the first two Super Bowls, Dan, I was a guard. I was. I was leading sweeps and trapping and everything else. I was a center by the time the last one came along. But I played I played guard nine and a half years and huh. center three and a half years. Oh, so when I played against you, you were a, you were a center. So that that was like the back end of your career. Mm -hmm. Huh? Yeah, that Fred Quillen had blown out his knee in the middle of the eighty seven. And Bruce years. Collier was the other guy, or uh, was it Sapolo? Well, the, the, the guards were Jesse Sapolo and Guy McIntyre. Yeah, when that's I, right. When I moved in the center, yeah. Um, what what do you think of Kelsey's career at center? I love it. I love it. I, it's um, you look at the things that they're able to do because of do you have a guy like that inside that could get out and move. And it's one thing to get out and move. A lot of guys can get out and run and you know run around cones and all that you know combine crap. But he got out there and he arrived in a nasty mood and was able to just drill people and they knew it when he was coming out on them. So I think that was, that was the difference. It, the, the ability to stick and then do something with a defender 
is what separated him. I, I thought he was really good. There's There's been a whole series of guys. I thought the earliest guy that really did that a lot was uh, Dwight Stevenson. He, he was high. I mean, I watched him abuse Michael Carter, and nobody abused nobody. Michael Carter. Nobody in the league. I thought Michael Carter was the best nose in the nose era. Yeah, and and he just he and he was something. Um, but he was he was the only guy that was doing he and you got to remember Dwight was doing that back in the late seventies and eighties. Um, so you fast forward and he's he's able to do that now. It's 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 very impressive, and I think it's something that you know, even now you watch college, you don't see many guys internal guys doing a whole lot of that. They they'll do some backside pulling on powers and whatnot, but encounters but you don't see a lot of centers doing what what jason can do you think jason's a hall of fame player you mentioned stevenson so obviously you think he is a hall of fame player right we'll see we'll see i i i'd love to sit in that room one time just to see what the hell those guys are thinking or what they have a conversation about but i think he's got the the bogeys he played long enough i mean he played 13 years he was he was in Pro Bowls. He was all pro. He, he, he got all the, the things that they're going to need to see. So I think, yeah, eventually he'll be in the, in the Hall of Fame. Are you disappointed with the process of Hall of Fame? Yeah. I, I don't know it, to be honest with you. I, uh, I've, I've gone to a bunch of the inductions for my teammates and for Eddie. But uh, I think what you really, really need, and he'll probably have that being a Philly guy, is a – Huge proponent. You need somebody that really kind of carries your candidacy. And I think that's something that's really important. And get in that room and really talk and really, you know, something that, that is that is really important. And then you see the guys, well, the guys that I think that are first ballot are always kind of obvious. You know, that was one of my favorite conversations, a lot of talking sports writers and they go, well, yeah, I could write, I'll write the nomination process for Jerry Rice. I'll stand up and go, ladies and gentlemen, Jerry, <laughs> Jerry Rice. Rice. Right. And sit down. <laughs> and sit, I, no, get this. I was told that that was the process. Get this. I was told by the guys like Jason Cole and like Jared Bell that I forget. Mm -hmm. I don't think it was Ann that did it. It had to be somebody else that did that. They stood up and they went, Jerry Rice, and he sat back down. And Jerry Rice was so disappointed that Rice goes, how come he didn't say anything about me? And there, and I told Jerry Rice the same thing. I go, Jerry, that's a compliment, okay? He doesn't yeah. have to go over your stats. You just go LT, and you sit down. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, the, the only other revelation I've got for you is water is wet. <laughs> oh, my God. All right, hey, I, I want to ask you some college stuff because you work college football. Mm -hmm. Caleb Williams or Jaden Daniels? If you're the Bears, who do you take? They're gonna they're gonna take Caleb Williams. Mistake. Um, I'm pretty I'm pretty convinced of that. My favorite quarterbacks in this draft are Jalen Daniels and Michael Penix. Um, you know, probably Bo Nix would be two B. Uh, I, I did, there's just and it's not because he's from SC. There's just something about looking at him in some big games and looking at him, the way he handles himself, you know, in front of the media and whatnot. And it's just, man, it, it, being a quarterback is, is as hard as it's ever been, you know, especially if you're going to be successful. And you've got to be a, a, a distinct combination of things. And I'm not sure if he doesn't have a, a category or two missing that's going to, that would make his, development a lot easier do you know what i'll tell you what um dion told michael irvin who michael irvin told me this about caleb the great quarterbacks never lose eyesight down the field when there's some pressure around him and he gets moved around in the pocket he takes his eyes down off down the field and he looks around him and he doesn't continue to stick in the pocket now pocket presence as you know randy that's part of the game, and that's the game back there in that pocket. You got to have toughness, and you can't be deterred when you got blitzers coming around him. Mm -hmm. And I thought anytime people brought pressure on him at Southern Cal, I went like this. I don't know. I mean, I see him jittery, and I think they moved him off the point. And Dion doesn't think his game's going to translate 
yeah. to the NFL level. Yeah, I, I'm with you. And there's certain things. He's got the arm. His arm is really impressive. And, you know, at his workout, I'm sure everybody that was present was just oohing and on. But, you know, when you get in that workout, are you throwing – that pass that has to go over a six foot two, six foot three linebacker and has to have enough zip on it to get to the right place, but not so much that it flies into the hands of the safety behind it and it can fit in that that five yard window, that's that vertical, that horizontal slot you're throwing into between the coverages. Um, and that the, the really good ones, you know, the Jalen's and other kind of guys like that. You see Tua do it, and Tua's got a gun. But Tua can throw touch passes. Brock Purdy can throw touch passes. A lot of those guys that can really do it, they can throw those touch passes. Mahomes can throw any pass with either hand, it seems like. Um, I just don't think the same of him. And be able to throw those passes at times where you're going to have to have the faith to throw it as you're getting the crap knocked out of you and know that you have the faith that you're delivering that spot that's 15 yards down the field, not 17, not 13, 15 yards down the field. It's seven feet off the ground, and you know your guy's going to go get it by the sideline. You'll throw it in a good enough spot where you can come down with two feet in bounds um, and have that kind of touch as you're getting drilled. And that's it's a rare thing. There's not that many guys have it, and that's why they make so much money to do it. Absolutely. And a couple last questions here for you. Um, this is why – Herm Edwards in the last hour who had Jaden Daniels at Arizona State before he transferred to LSU, he compared him to Randall. He mm -hmm. says he's that kind of guy with athleticism and with he just looks down the field and he's got a big arm and he's big play. And I asked him about the transfer. He said he walked in, Herm looked him in the face, and he goes, Coach, I'm going to go to LSU. And you know why? Because it was nil and it was all that. And it was Herm was getting some heat from the administration. So he yeah. knew he was going to go. But Herm was like, you have to go. And Herm goes, I talk to him every day. I love the kid. Yeah. So, I mean, me, in my opinion, I think of all the quarterbacks in that draft, I think it's him. And like you said, do you pick Penix because of some of the uh, wars that he's been through and have the comebacks with Indiana injuries? And he goes up to Washington, has success. Do you like to see guys like that? Yeah, yeah, I really do. I, I like that. I like the way he handles himself just across the board, not only in front of the media, but on the sidelines, everything. I just, there's something about him I think that is kind of special. And maybe those injuries, you know, are something that NFL teams are going to look at and, yeah, we're going to stay away. Um, that just means somebody's going to get him in a lot better sp spot than they should. That's the only thing there. And as far as Jalen goes, you don't – I mean, tell me the last guy. Look at what he did. You look at some of those games he played in and tell me the last guy that did what he did. The last guy that ran for those kind of yards, the guy that threw for those kind of yards and didn't throw for that many interceptions. It just – they don't do that. No. I, I, I mean, in that conference too. Yeah. You know, because you're going against the elite DBs in the conf in the country that are going to be high volume guys going into that draft too. So I mean, I always look at it that way too, Randy. Like when you look at Big Twelve, someone goes, "Well, this guy threw for 400, 600 yards in the Big 12. I'm like, I'm not sure that's a big deal. But yeah. when you throw for six hundred yards in the Southeastern Conference against a team in the SEC, right. you're there's an NFL guy and there's a couple NFL guys on that other roster over there. You're, that, that's not normal. And so I just think there's something special about him. I want to leave you with this. I got asked a question the other day. I did a show and someone goes, you know, what do you make of Mahomes and the comparisons with Brady? And I said, you know, I don't think those comparisons, I think it's more Montana. And I'll tell you why. Joe didn't need superstars around him to win. And I go, I'm not saying Brady had a ton of them. But, Joe, it was a luxury added because of a good organization. As you guys got better, they got better in the front office adding players mm -hmm. around Joe. But, Randy, in my opinion, Joe didn't need superstar players to win Super Bowls. And I'm not I, I'm not taking anything away from the O-line or anybody, but, I mean, yeah. there was no Jerry Rice on those teams. I mean, he 
I mean, am I right? The comparison is more about Montana and Mahomes than it is Mahomes and Brady. Yeah, I mean, the, the natural association for for people of, of this era is to default to Brady because of the sort of dynasty, dynastic feel of what they got going on. How many Super Bowls they've been, how many Super Bowls they've won, um, the way that he's played in the big game. Um, I, I look at a guy, you, you look at the Lamar Jackson in Baltimore, how happy is he? He gets, he gets Henry with him. That might be the one thing he was looking for to have a closer. And that's something that you know, maybe Pacheco in Kansas City, that Mahomes had a closer. Brady never really had a big time no. closer. They had some free agent backs that kind of rotated through. Sony Michelle, guys Dick, like that. They Dylan, weren't Dylan. real frontline dudes. Yeah, guys like Dylan and whatnot that, yeah. that were guys you could give the ball to in yeah. the fourth quarter. Yeah. Yeah. You're about to find out, you know, in Baltimore what that, that whole fourth quarter thing is. But in, in this era, in these last this grab it from fifteen on. Yeah, I, I think it's a I think it's a warranted comparison because he's how old is he? What is he? Twenty nine years 27. old. Twenty seven. So come on, <laughs> you know he's got a chance. He's got to be. He's got a chance to do a Barry Sanders. By the time he's thirty years old, three or four years from now, a couple of Super Bowls won, more, he's got a chance to just you know the happy trails into the sunset. You know, like Jim Brown and Barry and those guys did with with more in the tank, but just going. You know what? You're no longer challenging to me. <laughs> I'm out of here. I'm going to sneak one more in on you, Aaron Donald, Randy White. Who do you? Who would you not want to look forward to blocking? Um, I'd probably say Aaron. I loved I loved Randy. Um, oh Randy, my. Holy and Randy, cow! And Randy, Randy, Randy was quick. You love Randy the Roadrunner, huh? I I like. He hasn't changed, Dan. <laughs> no, he has. He he played that way in high school. He played that way in college. How yeah. many guys just yeah? Not not that he's boxed into a style, but but he he just aggravated everybody. Oh, he killed just people kept, in pit. He looked like he could still play. Yeah, five, six, seven more years, but he's going. Okay, I'll see you. You know, maybe he'll show up in an old a spaghetti western somewhere. <laughs> Moses, it was great getting your prophecy today. I want to well, thank, thank you, you very much for thank doing you. that so much for me, man, and finding time as you always do. Randy Cross, thank you so much for doing this. You know, it's an easy thing to grow hair. I don't know if you know that, but it's an easy thing. To grow hair. <laughs> I'm Italian. Hair grows the places I don't want it to grow. So let me leave it there. <laughs> All right, Dan. Thanks, man. Yeah. Thank you very much, my friend. I appreciate it. I love Randy Cross, man. Absolutely cool. Hit the like button. Keep it here. National Football Show. Underdog Fantasy is the easiest place to play fantasy sports and certainly the easiest when you're watching the NBA and the NBA playoffs are almost here and you can win money making picks. What are you waiting for? Sign up on underdogfantasy.com and use the promo code WIN. An underdog will double your first deposit up to $100. That's underdogfantasy.com. Use the promo code WIN. Get ready for the NBA and get ready for the NBA playoffs. Go to underdogfantasy.com. Use the promo code WIN. Philadelphia fans were cut from a different cloth. Born into a brotherhood and bonded to our team for life. We believe anything is possible because we've witnessed the impossible. While we may be from different neighborhoods, come Sunday, we are one and we will be heard. 
Pondley Hockey, official partner of the Philadelphia Eagles. Hi, everybody. My name is Jason Lombardi. I'm an inspector at DryTech. At DryTech, we offer three major services, the first one being basement waterproofing. The second service we offer is foundation and structural repairs. And then the third service that we offer is mold remediation. If you feel you are having a waterproofing issue, give DryTech a call or check us out online. Mike Little was a union construction worker who was badly, badly injured when he suffered a horrific fall because of someone's negligence. His life would change forever. It was just a real downward spiral with everything. Everything you do, and you're sitting home by yourself all day. Have no, you know, you can't go out because you can't drive, you can't walk well. It was just a horrible situation. Call Brian Fritz at the Fritz & Bianculli Law Firm at 215-548-2222. E-A-G-L-E-S, Eagles. I'll tell you one thing that's happened today. I got the sense that people really like the Barkley move and that it's going to be kind of like a McCaffrey um, addition to the offense for Jalen Hurts. My question is going to be, will... Kellen Moore, you see, everyone, including Herm Edwards and Randy Cross, you know, because McCaffrey, he said, because I asked the question, who would you build your team around? And he goes, well, um, I think he kind of sidestepped it. And he said, that team really runs through the, the running back. Isn't that how you took that? That he thought the – the 49ers ran through the running back. Now, okay, so is that what the Eagles are going to do? Are they going to run that offense? Is that offense going to resemble what they do in San Francisco and Philly? Is that the mentality? That's something for us to keep an eye on. I'm awake or you. Listen, I'm awake or you. If that's what they do, then the Barkley move would be a grand slam. Okay? But you paid a quarterback 50 and you got 2,000-yard receivers. That's a change in mentality. That's not looking for big play down the field. That's looking for big play in between the tackles. You're changing your mentality when you do that. Because McCaffrey, are you going to – hey, and if you lose McCaffrey and you change philosophy that way, you're gambling on his health. Seals, with the Eagles going to a 34 defense, won't that make Carter a huge talent with no position? Um, no, they're, no, you don't take him off the field. You move – Jordan Davis to the nose, that would be a natural position for him. And you put Carter on the strong side tackle spot, off at, uh, defensive end spot. You put him at the right end. The guy, the odd guy out, Nick, is going to be Josh Sweat. That's the odd guy out. Because you're either going to start Milton Williams or you're going to start – and by the way, honest to God, the first depth chart that I got didn't have Josh Sweat starting. It had Milton Williams starting. Then I got a second one, and it said Josh Sweat and Milton Williams. I think they thought they were moving him last week, and it was written in when the second one came. So, look, if you have Josh Sweat, Jordan Davis, and Jalen Carter as your front three, and you're 34, not awful. Not awful. With Williams and BG backing up, that's not awful. You probably need another body in there. But you're counting on Devin White and Nicobe Dean to play on guards. Okay, think about it, Nick. You're asking two guys who can't play the run to be on the guard. I have a 
those guys are not 34 linebackers. They're 43 linebackers. They're just not. They, they are not 43. They're not 34 linebackers. So, I mean, and then you you have on the other perimeter, you have Bryce Huff, who's not a run stopper. I, I'm i with you, MG. I just don't think it works. Now, you draft Chop Robinson and you put him on an end. See, to me, I think you have to play 40 front. And that's not what Fangio wants to do. He wants to play in a 34 because he believes, like, you heard what you heard what Herm said. I mean, if you missed it, Herm said, look, linebacker play, you have to have linebackers in a 34. They don't have to be superstars, but they've got to be functional and good. And they don't have good and functional. And he said the most important part of the 34 is the back end. And they're not good back there, especially at the corner position. Dude, I got to tell you, I don't think they move off of Bradbury because I don't think he can. Because I don't think they eat that number. I don't. And I think you're stuck with those corners. And, 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 and Yale, there's no chance in hell that they're stopping the run in the 34. They'll be the, how about this? If you play a 3-4 with that group, that I rifled off to you, you'll be last in the league in run defense. You'll be last in the league when it comes to run defense if you guys end up doing that. I just don't think they they, they need big-time linebacker help. That's right. Brian, when you play a 34, you've got to have people like this, Harry Carson, Lawrence Taylor, Carl Banks, Gary Reasons, Brad Van Pelt. You got to have guys like that. I mean, even Ron Rivera, Wilbur Marshall. You got to have players like that that are game changing, run stopping, and pass defensive guys. You just can't have dudes in there and sit there and think you're going to stop the run. By the way, I think tomorrow Tony Casillas um, will join us. We'll talk a little draft with him. <clears throat> he does some work with the Dallas Cowboys too. And we're still trying to run down Chris Sims. And Hopefully we get our friend Chris Sims on the program. All right, folks, I want you to please do me a favor. March Madness is here. Jacob Sports, we are looking for a select 500 folks of our loyal viewers and subscribers. I'm telling you, this is going to be a blast and a bunch of fun for us with our great partner at Underdog Fantasy. Okay, now this is what you do here. You sign up, you put 10 bucks in, they match it. 20 bucks, they match it with 20 bucks. They go all the way up to 100. Simple as that. Throughout the tournament, you can join throughout the tournament here for March Madness. Now you have to do this. You have to use the promo code WIN, W-I-N, that's W-I-N, okay? And, and by the way, link for underdog is pinned in the chat. You guys sign up. Do me a favor. Again, this is going to be a boatload of fun for everybody. I thank you guys so much for doing that. Big Joe, Xander, great stuff. All of you guys have been spectacular. Ian Beckles, Herm Edwards, and of course, Randy Cross. Thank you guys so much. Two to six tomorrow, and we'll see you on the flip side.